We are all but echoes of what has come before, and often this reality can have a dark history associated with it. The subject of this piece follows in line with this, both in terms of the machine to be covered, and of the people who made it. In the twilight of the dark periphery, in the new home for humanity built by the followers of the fleeing Star League Defense Forces, something from the most disgraceful chapter in Terran history would be resurrected and given a chance to live once more by a clan which has its own twisted beginnings. In this video, I will be talking about a battle mech and the deep history it has, as well as the history around it. To me, this machine encompasses the story of the clans themselves. The cruelty, terror, and over-engineering forged into this vehicle, as well as its timeline, is just too analogous. This is a machine that takes the strength of stone, and the size of a mountain, and combines it into a beast of steel. Behold the monstrosity itself. Clan Smoke Jaguars. Stone Rhino. The story of the famed Stone Rhino has its origins in an era before the time of the clans, and before their great founders rise to prominence. Nicholas Kerensky. During the last days of the Ameris Civil War, one of the cruelest conflicts in human history, desperation would be the father of a failed invention, but one which would resonate long past its own limitations. Much like many of the entities that would have a hand in the creation of what would become known as the Behemoth, the Rimworld's Republic and its leader, President Stefan Ameris would perform a hostile takeover of the Terran hegemony. First Lord and Director General Richard Cameron would be executed by Ameris the Usurper, someone who Richard had thought was his friend, before the President would declare that the Terran hegemony was under his control, and had now become in fact the Ameris Empire. Ameris would then crown himself Emperor of this new state. There were difficulties with this as one might imagine, in the aftermath of the hostile and violent takeover of Terra and its hegemony by the Rimworld's army, the Emperor had not dealt with the lion's share of the SLDF, or the Star League Defense Forces, as they had been campaigning against rebellions in the periphery, and he also had many enemies within the borders of his new empire, in the form of insurgents, loyal hegemony armed forces soldiers, and the remnants of other SLDF troops. A conflict over Ameris' coup would rage from December of 2766 through to November of 2779, known as the Ameris Civil War or the Star League Civil War. The forces of the Rimworld's army proved themselves very capable, and they were reinforced by conscription and mass armament production from within the Terran state. But all the same, they would slowly and steadily be pushed back as the self-declared Emperor Stefan Ameris, who once believed he would stand as the first among equals with the Great Houses, began to lose his mind as the walls increasingly began to close in on him. He would begin making erratic orders to stand and fight against all odds, or would make increasingly impossible demands from engineers, scientists, and others, looking for a miracle weapon that might turn the tide of this conflict. One of the wonder weapons designed to do just that would be the SAM-RS2 Matar. This proposed war machine pushed the boundaries of what was physically possible with myomers, internal structure, and tonnage. The Matar is the first true super heavy battle mech, at least as to get as far as having a prototype model. In his wild fantasies, Ameris believed that super heavy battle mechs could be produced in some numbers which could do battle with entire companies of enemy battle mechs on their own, and come out as the winner in such engagements. The same theory would be tried with other experimental superweapons as well, such as the one-off Rifleman 3, but almost universally the results would be inconsequential to the conflict. Logistics wins wars, not desperately built 
ghost rifle platforms. Unfortunately for the Emperor, the Matar would become known as Amaris' Folly, and this was constantly interrupted and interfered with by the erratic ruler as his cousin, General Rifkin Amaris, tried to make the project work. With his cousin's interventions, however, the design would become mired in unreasonable requests, and it would create further technical problems. The project was a pipe dream seemingly from the start. Built on a similar principle as what the Star League would put together as the Annihilator, seemingly, this monster was supposed to be more of a defensive asset. It was a giant mobile turret masquerading as a battle mech, rather than a truly dynamic battlefield asset. Extremely heavily armed and armored, this platform would even use visual trickery to deceive opponents as to where its main guns were in fact hidden on the chassis, through deeply mounting its main gauss weapons in the torso, hiding their full size from view. This sadly created safety problems, which were brushed away with the idea that the mech itself would somehow be impervious to enemy fire, or that its enemies would be destroyed long before they made contact with the mech. Such delusional thinking is how immobile and functionally limited but expensive battle mech projects seem to start, and the Matar was no exception to this. The engineers would eventually have a plan for seemingly everything. Weapons for infantry, electronic countermeasures, super heavy armored plating. The design reached its full prototype stage in 2775, only four years before the war would come to a close. The main problem was, the mech just couldn't move. Despite having the appropriate engine, and in theory having everything set in place, its myomers and actuators just couldn't handle the stress of a 110-ton frame. And that was not resolved or impacted by several new teams that were brought on board to solve this particular issue. Stefan Amaris's grand defender, the great colossus that would save him and his empire, stood motionless on the test range. Amaris and his cousin, in a fury born of paranoia and desperation, would order the execution of the team of engineers and designers of this wonder weapon for criminal incompetence, before the project would be shelved. In the last of the time he had, the Emperor had become increasingly disconnected from reality, rambling often like a madman as Alexander Kerensky and the Star League Defense Forces closed in on him, in his lair on Terra. He would commit unspeakable atrocities on a planet-wide scale to even attempt to slow the advance of Kerensky. And he saw to it that anyone who emerged to challenge him, question him, or became disloyal were punished most severely and permanently. Countless millions perished in the conflict, one which the Matar would never actually see, despite being conceived for it. Amaris and his cadre would finally be defeated with the fall of his palace, and directly at the hands of General Alexander Kerensky in his Orion battle mech. Shortly after, the Emperor and his immediate family would be summarily executed, though not for the crime of killing so many civilians or dragging out the war, but truthfully for wiping out Richard Cameron's family, the House of Cameron. Alexander Kerensky found their openly rotting bodies in the tomb that had become the sealed throne room, and would commit to killing Stefan Amaris's family, Barring a few bastards and distant relatives, the Star League Defense Forces would succeed in functionally annihilating the most powerful noble house in the history of the periphery, though now one of the most despised in all of history, especially after the full revelations of Amaris' crimes. Realizing the game was up and attempting to save his own skin, Rifkin Amaris would attempt to conceal his identity, and would try to depart Terra in the aftermath of the Rimworld's defeat. With him, he had the detailed notes and schematics for the Matar. Unfortunately for Rifkin, he would be apprehended in his escape attempt, and as one of his cousin's close allies, he would face charges of war crimes, crimes against the Star League, and crimes against humanity, among others. The now former general of the defeated state would face a lighter sentence than many of his siblings and cousins, who were often executed and he ended up receiving only a 20-year sentence for his participation in the war. This strangely comparatively favorable outcome, however, was just the punishment he received from the Star League's courts. The reality was that his detainment and imprisonment would be a death sentence all the same, 
as within a year of his incarceration, he would be violently murdered by his fellow inmates in what is described as a lynching. It appears judgment was passed by more than simply the SLDF's tribunal. With his death, the last man involved with the creation of this failed Super Heavy Battle Mech passed from this world. Nonetheless, the Matar's design, the materials around it which he'd salvaged from the war and had attempted to flee with, did survive past him. These came into the possession of the Star League Defense Forces. Engineers and scientists would archive this failed venture, and it would be little more than a footnote, apparently. At the same time, however, the inner sphere itself was seemingly going mad. The Great Houses, seeing the destruction of the balancing force at the center of the inner sphere in the Star League, had become increasingly ambitious. Seeing a doomed future forming for mankind in the inner sphere, Alexander Kerensky knew his former army would either begin to disband and distribute back to many of their home territories, or it would end up fighting a hopeless war of destruction against all remaining member states of the very Star League they swore to protect. Both outcomes would make the oncoming conflict all the more apocalyptic. Instead of contributing to even more blood spilled, Kerensky would begin to plan to depart the Inner Sphere with the majority of the war-scarred veterans and their families that he could find and convince, along with scientists, engineers, and anyone who could help them embark on their journey into the dark night beyond the Inner Sphere. Operation Exodus would begin, and before the end of 2785 would arrive, Kerensky and his followers would pass beyond the immediate periphery, down what would eventually become known as the Exodus Road. What awaited them, they did not know. Had they known, they would have stayed behind. All the same, each of the houses would declare themselves as the new First Lord of the Star League, starting with Coordinator Karita Minonoru in 2786. The succession wars had begun, and much of the former Star League and the people Kerensky and his followers left behind burned. Only ever built as a prototype in 2775, the Matar is a 110-ton super-heavy battle mech using a combination of introductory and advanced Star League era technologies. Envisioned as the last defender of a failing regime, this hulking monstrosity was built to engage and destroy targets from afar, as well as to protect itself from bothersome incoming skirmishers and recon forces, such as light mechs and vehicles. This overview will be done under the assumption that the mech would be able to move to engage targets on the battlefield. However, all of its quirks would normally exclude it from doing that. It has the non-functional leg actuators and illegal design quirks, meaning it, in essence, when using the advanced rules, can't actually move. That itself is an indicator that maybe something went wrong at the design process. To start with, the Matar has an oversized 11-ton internal structure due to its 110-ton mass. It maintains a standard gyro and cockpit, though this is of course due to the technical limitations of its time. We're unsure of its internal electronic systems, as no documents have been left behind as to its targeting and tracking or communications packages. It did utilize double heat sinks, which it invests a further 4 tons into, giving it 28 cooling per turn. This works exceptionally with its weapon systems, as it could fire most of its onboard offensive systems without overheating unless it fired all three variants of its large lasers together. This laser fire, to be clear, wouldn't have critically overheated the mech either. Thankfully, for the pilot, the Matar has no explosive ammunition types on board, which means that should the pilot wish to suffer the consequences for themselves, they could in fact fire turn on turn while overheating the mech with no openly catastrophic results, until the mech experienced a forced shutdown of some sort. While in reality it cannot move, the designers did intend for the Matar to at least be able to traverse ground under its own power, even if that failed. To achieve this, a 10-ton, 210 fusion standard engine of an unknown type was installed into the mech. This meant that this Super Heavy had a maximum speed of 32 kilometers per hour, something very similar to the Annihilator. The purpose of this lumbering giant is much the same as many mech commanders would propose to make it a slow-moving wall, designed to hold choke points or to stop enemy advances. The issue is, in reality, both in real war and on the tabletop, 
Such unwieldy machines rarely work out as intended. The slow speed means that it can never really reposition, should it have even worked if it became compromised by an enemy breakthrough or by being out of position. More disappointing, it also means that it has few options to withdraw from a bad situation, and is very likely to become the victim of artillery attacks as well. In other words, the Matar is slow. Too slow to work correctly. Something as huge as a hulking 110-ton battle mech would be expected to have serious investments in physical defense, and the Matar frankly doesn't disappoint in this respect. More heavily guarded even than Kerensky's legendary Atlas, it was built to have 20.5 tons of star slab armor, which would yield it an enormous 327 points of armored protection, which is genuinely impressive. This was needed, however, given that the mech could practically barely move, and may be under pressure from enemy weapons fire, or indirect weapons fire, for prolonged periods without much support of its own. To try to add survivability, the designers wisely equipped it with a Guardian ECM along with this thick, heavy plating, at least giving the mech the opportunity to mask itself from enemy sensors before rounds began flying downrange. Notably, it lacks cases for its explosive gauss components, which is potentially a catastrophic problem. The most impressive portion of the Matar is its weapons, to be clear. Seeking to decimate a mixed company of mediums, lights, and heavies is a difficult task to perform, and given that it was a mission design goal for the Matar, it needed to come through on this front. It somewhat does, even if this goal would be frankly overambitious. To start with, it has large pulse lasers mounted in each of its arms, giving it great in-close hitting power, and accurate fire against light mechs which might seek to overwhelm it in close. These were expressly chosen for this purpose, in fact. To deal with infantry forces that may attempt to overwhelm it as well, it has a pair of flamethrower units in its side torsos, which will turn any kind of infantry assault into a terrifying and macabre barbecue invitation where the guests bring the meat. Most importantly, it has two side torso mounted gauss rifles, with two tons of ammunition per gun. These cannons will rip through any armored fighting vehicles that attempt to engage it, and can potentially destroy enemy mechs in a single hit, should the gauss rifle find its way to the head of the enemy target. These weapons also produce almost no heat, making them easily able to be fired turn on turn, where lasers otherwise may have to cycle due to heat concerns. Finally, the Matar backs these rifles up with a single extended range large laser mounted in the center torso. Overall, this is a devastating level of firepower, especially for its era of introduction. The Matar is, to be blunt, a poor performer, in spite of its heavy plating and extremely capable weaponry. It's too slow, and while yes, it has twin large pulse lasers, it will never really be able to keep back light elements from forcing it out of position as it tries to deal with them. Guarding choke points are at best, holding actions under most conditions. And more unfortunately yet, the Matar is just too slow, even if its legs actually worked, to back out of these difficult positions. Meaning even if these holding actions were successful against its intended opponents, the SLDF, it would just mean the loss of the machine and the death of its pilot in all likelihood after holding the road or pass. This was a machine designed by order of a madman in his final years, as he tried hopelessly to cling to power and to life. And it shows. This would be a glorified tomb for those who would be his loyal followers into the afterlife. Those who chose to die alongside him in the apocalyptic fighting which took place during the Civil War. Thankfully for humanity as a whole, this battle mech never had the chance to kill the men and women of the Star League Defense Forces, or its would-be pilots. Before delving into the Rhino start, one must understand the transition of what happened between the time of the noble Star League Defense Forces to what they would become, to understand why the Matar would have new life breathed back into it in the first place. 
who would be the creators of this reborn behemoth? Because those who fled the inner sphere are not reflective of those who would become the clans. In the great beyond, well past the watching eyes of the former members of the Star League, on their journey to find a new frontier to call home, the Star League defense forces would slowly but surely descend into various forms of madness. Alexander Kerensky had led these courageous soldiers for decades against the enemies of the Star League, and now he captained their journey to save the light of mankind, supposedly, or at the very least to deflect the sword he had forged away from the established home of humanity. But the journey was simply too much, and it was too desperate for many. There would be mutiny, such as the Prince Yugen incident, and there would be disaffection throughout this, with a tragic response from Kerensky as he attempted to keep the morale of those around him in order at all costs. Eventually, five somewhat habitable worlds would be discovered, known as the Pentagon Worlds. These would be landing zones for the first exodus. From here, these worlds would become shadows of the states they descended from, which was exactly what Kerensky did not want to see unfold. One of the greatest challenges these refugees from their own worlds now possessed is that they were still, deep down, holding on to many of the ideals and identities of their old homes in the inner sphere. Many of the people now on these new colonies would coalesce into their like-minded camps, representing their houses of origin. As one can imagine, the new settlements with massive military stockpiles, would prepare to turn on one another as ancient rivalries once more boiled over, becoming grim reflections of what was taking place in the inner sphere, now many light years away. The succession war simply followed the Star League Defense Forces into the night, which truth be told was a damning indictment on humanity. Kerensky would see his friends die as the situation began to spiral out of control, Notably, the ambush murdering his friend General Aaron de Chavier, but also just personal tragedies such as the death of his spouse. He would not live long enough to put down the latest slew of rebellions, now exploding through the realm he was responsible for. The problem that came with Alexander growing old and approaching death beyond the obvious was the inner sphere as a whole did have another tradition that followed the explorers and settlers into these new worlds, and one which was not necessarily linked to the nation-states themselves, but to the culture that governed them. Neo-feudalism had been institutionalized by House Cameron, and then later by other great houses, and lesser nobles long before the formation of the Star League, and had been reinforced around the inner sphere for centuries. Along with these means of governing, came the culturally accepted practice and expectation of hereditary rule. While General Kerensky had been the leader, there were expectations, especially now in his dying days, that there be a successor to his rule, at least among his most fervent followers. And one person seemed poised to do this. His eldest son, Major General Nicholas Kerensky. That had its own issue that would arise, especially after Alexander gave his blessing and endorsement to Nicholas prior to his death. And it was that in a hereditary succession-oriented culture, what happens when this kind of system results in something extremely... unexpected? People close to Nicholas prior to his rise to power would note many of his personality flaws, which would only be amplified by his leadership. The truth was, Alexander Kerensky, for all of his imperfections, wanted what was best for those who served with him, even if he had to make terrible choices regarding their lives in many cases, from the exodus to putting down mutinies. Nicholas Kerensky, however, was a man who had many hidden, deeply disturbing psychological problems, starting with displaying the dark triad of personality traits. He was narcissistic, short-tempered, insecure in regards to his position compared to his father, Machiavellian, and either possessed sociopathic or psychopathic tendencies. A difficult childhood, along with his life on Terra under the rule of Stefan Amaris, had created an abnormally twisted interior, 
to the son of the great general of the Star League. Nicholas did have his private moments of compassion or empathy, but these seemed distant as compared to his normally cold and aloof nature. This also said nothing of his utopian vision for mankind, or what mankind should be, and how it could be reshaped into a new nature in order to ensure it fed his vision of a perfect world, a world ruled through his idealized warriors. In other words, what do you do when the title of leadership falls into the hands of a madman? Especially with a personality cult forming around him as some kind of savior to the war-ravaged, damaged people of the military outfit that had been the Star League Defense Forces. Decades of trauma now resulted in broken, often dehumanized, and generally violence-oriented people finding their way into his thrall. Even some senior leaders of the now exiled forces embraced him, while perhaps deluding themselves in doing so, if only for the hope of a return to some kind of stability. Nicholas is the only answer. He may not have the seasoning of age, and he has an air about him that makes people uncomfortable, but he is a division commander. He has something that no one else does. The Kerensky name. In this time and place, what the soldiers and people of this new Star League need is consistency. Nicholas shares the same vision of his father, only filtered through the lens of someone who grew up in the hell that was life on Terra under Ameris. Who better then to lead us into a future to ensure we don't fall prey to the same mistakes? Lieutenant General Antonius Zalman, September 1st, 2801. Despite receiving oaths of loyalty from many commanders, Nicholas would not gain a grip on the Pentagon worlds and many would reject his leadership from the start, especially as what was called the Exodus Civil War began to rage even more violently. These people had no time for Kerensky's sons, and had their own scores to settle. This rejection was not something Nicholas would take lightly, as he took his most loyal followers, and over a million civilians they would... rescue, to depart the Pentagon worlds in another Exodus and with them, taking as many military and industrial assets as they could. Today, we leave behind everything we've known and everyone we've loved. Again. Once more, the greed of the House Lords has infected the Star League and threatened to rip it apart. And with it, the ideals we have pledged ourselves to. We cannot allow that to happen again. But to ensure our continued survival, we must take drastic action. The days ahead will not be easy, nor will the sacrifices to be endured. But I promise the rewards will be greater than any of us can imagine. Major General Nicholas Kerensky's message to his fleet, February 12th, 2802. From here, they would step once more into the dark, only to come across a new home, the already established colony of Strana Nekti, an environmentally stable world whose colonists would welcome them, whether they wished to or not. The land of dreams would be the testbed for Nicholas's new society, and for him to consolidate power even further in this isolated frontier. Temporary camps for the new arrivals would morph into small cities as the world began to rapidly develop. And from here, Nicholas, with the original colonists of the world cowed, at least for now, and with his loyal followers in tow, would embark on forging his military into the sharpest of steel. Dangerous and brutal training tests, or what would eventually be called trials, were drilled over and over again. It was as if he plunged his new military into the harshest of fires to create the strongest that he could. It was survival of the fittest almost, something which Nicholas most certainly seemed obsessed with, and beyond just military matters. Only the elite would remain by the end of it. Large numbers of mech warriors, soldiers, tankers, and others 
died or were maimed in these supposed military tests and exercises, and at a much higher burn rate than would ever be acceptable. Most of those who survived, but didn't meet the strict requirements Nicholas had put in place, were shuffled out of military service permanently. Those who did not participate at all were cast into the lowest levels of society possible. Ultimately, the most loyal and the most dangerous were now his army. The elite he sought were now there. Meanwhile, as the years passed, infrastructure, agriculture, and industries would begin being constructed with the equipment they'd taken from the Pentagon worlds. All of these were necessary as to create the force to embark on Kerensky's grand vision. New worlds would be colonized as well, throughout what eventually would be called the Kerensky Cluster. But all was not well, as even amongst Nicholas's cult of personality, and amongst the oppressed original inhabitants of Stranum Necti, there would be protests and demonstrations against his rule as things took a more authoritarian turn. These often ended in arrests, and even in executions. Religion would be slowly suffocated, though not fully extinguished in the immediacy, as Nicholas portrayed himself as the savior of mankind, deliberately feeding the personality cult around him. He was a secular messiah to his followers now, more than ever. Six years after his father's death, Nicholas would announce the birth of the clans, this new political, societal, and military force under his command. 800 warriors were chosen from his followers, those who would pass his final tests, and who would be the founders of the bloodlines of the clans. They would be divided into 20 clans of 40 warriors each, Every single one of the clans, save one, would also have a totem animal, to reflect their nature. Each would have a Khan as a leader, and a Sakan as their second. To be a clan warrior would be to be the first amongst the castes after further reforms were made. The castes were property of the clans themselves, including the warriors. Merchants, technicians, laborers, and scientists made up other designated groups, all of whom became pawns in Nicholas's great gamble and grand vision. Amongst the castes, civilians were slowly but surely subjected to the eugenics program Nicholas wished to enact, and children were encouraged in large numbers. This would eventually become more than encouraged, and became mandated after Kerensky's grip on power was fully established. With time, Genetic modifications would begin to be proposed, and then enacted, all in the hopes of building a better human, one which was more suited for the new world the clans wished to see. They would have less defects and less undesirable traits, and more desirable ones even. People became cattle, as some were selected for fertilization as surrogates, even for offspring unrelated to themselves. Kerensky's salvation to mankind had rapidly become slavery, disassociation, and the end of people's basic rights and humanity. It was the society of caste slavery. Con Winham says we must have faith, that we will find our way. 800 years ago, this is the technology that a petty earth tyrant would have used to create the perfect race before killing every other man, woman, and child on the planet. We don't need love, and now we don't even need sex. Someone should have burned Darwin at the stake when they had the chance. Mech Warrior Bright and Gray, October 19th, 2819. After a failed attempt on Nicholas's life, his rule would be cemented, as well as the foundations of his clan society. Krensky declared that all children would become part of the clan's fostering program, essentially divorcing the children from their families as a means of indoctrinating them, but also as a part of Nicholas's ideal society, one which discarded the notion of family. All of those connections and emotional investments were just an obstacle to perfection. After these reforms, after stripping the citizens of the worlds around him of most of what it meant to be a human being throughout most of mankind's history, 
in terms of family and basic values. Nicholas Kerensky would declare that the clans had become completed. Today the clans are complete. Having guided us to this place, Nicholas has taken his rightful place as Ilkhan. Our course is clear. We will soon return to the Pentagon. We will crush the evil that has infected those worlds and their people. And we will bring them civilization that will save them. Star Captain Carl Isaza, June 9th, 2815. The first batch of successful Iron Womb created children would be born in 2820, one year before Operation Klondike. With time, trueborn warriors would be set as the pinnacle, the ideal of the society. Sex was detached amongst the warriors from reproduction in its entirety. They would conquer the Pentagon worlds and visit upon the people they rescued with the inhumanity of what Nicholas had built. A caste society without family, a warrior society without people to truly defend, and a world without the core spirit of humanity. In the wake of this destruction, Clan Wolverine would die for daring to deviate from Krensky's vision too much. After them, Widowmaker would be destroyed and absorbed into Clan Wolf, but only after Nicholas Krensky was killed while attempting to intervene in a trial between the Khan of Clan Wolf and Widowmaker. The clans would only further evolve down the path of eugenics, caste systems, and humanity's misery from here. One thing would never change. The castes were property of the clan and little else. Stefan Amaris, the villain of the Star League's past, had been little more than a vicious and brutal dictator. A self-interested man who wanted more power for himself and his family. He was the extreme of human greed, deception, and self-indulgence. Nicholas Kerensky was something altogether more terrifying. I created the caste system with a purpose. A purpose I thought you understood. Having our people in castes removes them from the societal tensions and rifts that our forebears dealt with. Castes remove the drives of people to attempt to better themselves through bringing civil disorder. I thought you understood that. Ilkhan Nicholas Kerensky, speaking with Khan Sarah McEvity, June 12th, 2822, after the fall of the Pentagon Worlds. The founder of Clan Smoke Jaguar was one Franklin Osis, who was born in the Federated Sons, but to an SLDF-serving family. He and his brother Simon would, however, be born only a few years before the Exodus, and their true early home would be the interior of starships, and then the world of Eden on the other side of Kerensky's Exodus. In the disorder that was appearing on the Pentagon worlds, Simon would feel compelled to join a gang, and later Franklin would join him. And after that, they and a band of criminal cohorts committed murders, as well as arson. The brothers would then find themselves in a penal colony for their participation in these acts. Brutality seemed to be what they were surrounded by at every stage of their lives. Next, the brothers would be liberated from these camps in the chaos of the Exodus Civil War, but didn't seek to become a part of it. The response by the central authority after their release was to crush all rebels. And this broke something inside of Franklin. After all the turmoil of his life, he would join Nicholas Kerensky's second exodus, looking for peace. On the new world of Strana Nekti, Franklin, who had been a troubled man from his time in the gangs and the penal colony, and from the violence and instability of the Pentagon worlds, found some degree of peace in the nature of his new home. In that nature, with his brother Simon alongside him, the closest person in his life, they would be ambushed and attacked by a smoke jaguar, a genetically engineered creature, 
made by man and built to inhabit these new lands. His sibling would scream horrifically as his throat was torn out, all while Franklin was stunned with fear at first. This then morphed into rage before Franklin slaughtered the jaguar in a frenzy with only a small hunting knife. His hesitation would fail to save Simon Osis, however. This story is important as it describes the smoke jaguars, not the animal, but the clan which Franklin was the founder and first con of. Because Franklin felt pleasure in the violence he had unleashed upon the jaguar, the life of violence he'd come to Strana Nekti to escape had not only followed him, but he'd learned that it was something not to be feared or avoided. It was something to be embraced. From this moment onwards in his life, he would take every opportunity to face danger and conquer it through combat whenever given the chance. Violence was the only language he could truly understand, at least deep down. Kerensky would select Osis to become the leader as well as the founder of Clan Smoke Jaguar, and he would be in that role for 30 years. Osis would then encourage his clan to indulge in the violence that he now found pleasure in, and fostered a sense of superiority over non-warriors. In fact, it went further than that, as he would only see glory in being a warrior, and would pass this on as well viewing all lesser castes as being undeserving in almost every respect, going well beyond arrogance. This would become so pervasive within the clan that even after his death, Osis's successors punished their lower castes and pressed them so relentlessly that they seemingly benefited the least from the golden century, at least from internal development, until the latter portion of it. The golden century, by and large, was the era of the greatest technological and societal advances made by the clans as a whole. While the Jaguars would participate in it, their contributions were comparatively limited, and often were dependent on taking things from others. In fact, Clan Smoke Jaguar would come to view their lesser castes with an overt level of scorn with the passage of time. While other clans warriors would simply view themselves as being superior, the Jaguars would look upon their civilian castes with more and more ire. The only value they had in life was trial by combat. Their technology stagnated. So they challenged other clans for their technologies on the field of battle. Their industries faltered. So they would challenge other clans for their resources. Brutality and bloodshed were always the answer to these problems. And this seemingly worked despite the Jaguars being in essence economically and technologically backwards in terms of their ability to develop. But there was always a solution to catch up. More violence. The only clan perhaps more aggressive than they were during these formative years, during the Golden Century, was Clan Mongoose. Ironically, Smoke Jaguar's greatest achievement was crushing this other clan and absorbing their territories and civilian castes for themselves bolstering the clan's population, industrial base, and potential scientific capabilities, but only in the medium term. Their status as the premier clan military would begin to falter, just before the clan invasion. They'd pushed too far in one direction, and with no enhanced productivity or loyalty from their lower castes, and with a culture of outright disdain and hostility for freebirths, trade, as well as even colonization, Clan Smoke Jaguar seemed prepared to decline, rather than resting at the top of the mightiest of clans. Barring their raw military might and prowess, of course, but even that would have faded with time with no real support. In all of this though, there were breakthroughs that the Jaguars did achieve, truly in spite of themselves. Interestingly, one of which would come from a dead man's legacy, the great enemy of the Star League, and perhaps one who shared more in common with this clan and the others around it than those in this new, barbaric society might wish to see. In the mid-29th century, 
As a part of a passion project by several clan smoke jaguar scientists and technicians, a group within the clan would attempt to prove the superiority of the clans, though not necessarily their own clan given the tensions between Cass and smoke jaguar, by perfecting and repurposing the schematics for the mech known as the Matar. Ameris' Folly, the 110-ton monstrosity which never worked, would have been an obscure item even by clan standards. Most clan mechs had been born of more mainstream developments, building upon what the Star League Defense Forces had brought with it to the Pentagon Worlds and Kerensky Cluster. The Matar, however, was an invention of the cursed and despised Ameris Empire. These individuals would tackle their goal, and a monster would begin to take shape. What had been 110 tons, and inoperable, had become 100 tons, and that was more than intimidating enough. The Jaguar scientists and technicians themselves would manage to get this design approved for usage in Clan Smoke Jaguar. This would be one of the achievements of the Jaguars during this time, and it definitely shows just how far behind they were. While the Smoke Jaguars would create marvelous wonders like the Mad Dog in the 30th century, this was through acquiring technologies and know-how from Clan Coyote and Clan Wolf through trials and combat. For the Stone Rhino, they did have the template to work off of for the unfortunate Matar, but in contrast to many other sophisticated clan designs, their new battle mech would be comparatively primitive in terms of its materials and components. Entering production in 2847, the Stone Rhino would be born. The name of this re-engineered monstrosity was taken from local fauna on the planet of Eden, which was a beast which had been named by the settlers on that world as the Stone Rhino, due to its impervious hide. Outside of its heat sinks and its clan standard weaponry, truthfully the Stone Rhino could have been a product of the early Star League era, or even before that. There were few complex components on board, and while it makes the battle mech perhaps more durable in some senses, and certainly makes it cost less to manufacture, it is not a peer with mechs such as the Direwolf or Blood Asp, or many others by comparison, at least in the Assault Mech tier. Because of the relatively poor economic capabilities of Clan Smoke Jaguar, not many of these stone rhinos were manufactured, regardless of the point of pride which they seemed to take in them at least upon their initial development. The Smoke Jaguar Tumen, or military, would always have the majority of these behemoths as a result of them building them. The Stone Rhino is a rare machine throughout most of clan history, due to its limited manufacturing, as mentioned just prior. But as a result, many of these battle mechs would acquire long, storied histories, often being seen as an almost unique artisan battle mech, rather than a production line unit perhaps having more in common with how the Inner Sphere treated their machines during the Succession Wars, rather than the more utilitarian view of equipment that the clans traditionally have. These venerable war machines would bear the marks of decades, and eventually centuries, of combat across trials throughout clan space, and eventually the desperate and bloody fighting of the Inner Sphere. Each one seemingly has its own spirit, their own subtle differences from one another. This monstrous battle mech would be captured in trials by other clans, resulting in small numbers appearing within each of the homeworld clans, and eventually their invading counterparts. Of the clans that didn't produce them, Ghost Bear would use them the most frequently, though every other clan in the invasion corridor did have some of them as well. As an interesting aside, shortly after its development, a trial of absorption would begin between Clan Smoke Jaguar and Clan Mongoose. As I mentioned prior, the battle between the two aggressive clans would be harsh. Clan Mongoose had made too many enemies in 2868, when their constant probing attacks and low intensity conflicts with almost all of their neighbors, and notably with Clan Smoke Jaguar, boiled over. After an incident with the Grand Council of the Clans, where Clan Mongoose Khan Walter Martindale would make the mistake of quoting Nicholas Kerensky as a means of covering his own political maneuvering to disrupt Clan Smoke Jaguar and the other clans' reprisals against him and his clan, Khan Theodore Osis 
would demand a trial of absorption against the mongooses immediately, justifying it as mongoose being sacrilegious and cowardly. They would be granted this by the council unanimously, and in the same council session. What would follow would be the first major conflict that the stone rhino would appear in. The underprepared mongoose soldiers fought bravely by all accounts against their smoke jaguar adversaries, but it would be impossible to say that they could have been prepared to face the wrath of machines like the stone rhino, when and where it appeared. It is not hard to imagine the last defenders of this doomed clan being forced to face down the perfected machines of Stefan Ameris's depraved ambitions. It goes without saying, the mongooses were crushed. Something that is important to point out though, is that after this conflict, the Stone Rhino would become a second line battle mech, with the rise of the much more prestigious Omnimex taking its role. Omnimex would become more and more frequent and common in frontline formations until they would come to dominate them. In the Inner Sphere, this concept had been whittled away by the Succession Wars, where almost any mech that could fight would be welcome as a part of a frontline combat unit, but in the clans, this was not the same. In trials, especially if one side were the aggressor, they would want to put their premier machines at the point of the fighting, which would typically be their most sophisticated and powerful clan Omnimex, which the Stone Rhino just simply is not. Even during the eventual invasion to liberate their former home, for most of the offensive operations, the Stone Rhino wouldn't be present in many instances, and instead would be more used as a defending or garrison war machine. Later on, as resources became increasingly sparse for the clans, these policies would be relaxed. By the time of the Ill Clan era, second line mechs as a whole would be found in frontline formations much more frequently. A clan assault mech weighing in at 100 tons, the Stone Rhino is a comparatively primitive, brutal, durable, bludgeoning tool for any mech warrior to use against their foes in the circle of equals of the 29th and 30th centuries, or in the unforgiving battlefields of the 31st and 32nd centuries. During the clan invasion, Inner Sure pilots, not knowing its clan name, would dub it as the Behemoth, a name clan warriors themselves respected, given the overbearing nature of it. In spite of it being a product of the Golden Century, it really does resemble much of the economic, physical resource, and technological shortcomings of Clan Smoke Jaguar during this time, as it doesn't use many of the advanced features found even in second line Clan battle mechs. To start with, rather than having a Clan Endo Steel internal structure, something which would have been simple to accommodate, it instead has a standard 10 ton internal structure. As it is a product of the 29th century, it has a normal cockpit and gyro as well, which is expected as these would be almost universal at the time. For cooling, it has clan double heat sinks and vests no additional tonnage in them. This means that it will cool by 20 every turn, and that is almost enough to keep it heat neutral from its main weaponry if it doesn't walk or run every turn it fires. As far as its onboard electronics are concerned, the Stone Rhino has a Garrett L15 communications package, and its targeting and tracking suite is the RCA InstaTrack version 8A. Neither of these confer any meaningful bonus to the mech. When it comes to quirks, I will add this briefly. I think given that the Stone Rhino is not actually a super heavy mech, these quirks are incredibly punitive, and when using the advanced rules, they more or less make the mech have a very minimal value as a result, especially since quirks don't impact battle value. I personally think that this mech has been wrongly quirked, especially in the context of other assault mech machines that we have seen that are very similar, and I will be bringing this up a little bit later in this review and at the end of this video. So, let's start with the traits that aren't actively detrimental to it. It has barrel fisted for both of its arms, as well as protected actuators to help it against infantry attacks. The Rhino's worst traits 
are that it has weak head armor 1, it has oversized, making it harder to use cover to gain defensive bonuses, and worst of all, it has poor performance. The latter means that the stone rhino must walk one turn before it can run. If it stops running, it must walk again to start running again. This means even if it jumps, the next turn it cannot run. Quirks are a relatively recent addition to the game, and it's such a shame the Stone Rhino receives this many terrible quirks. And just as a final aside, it is especially baffling when you compare it to the Marauder 2, which is most definitely not a narrow mech, and has the narrow trait. But I digress. Most players don't actually use quirks when they play, regardless. 100 ton battle mechs often suffer with mobility in some way, and the Stone Rhino is no different despite attempting to mitigate its maneuvering through the addition of jump jets. Still, it is a vastly superior upgrade over its predecessor, the Matar. Powered by a 19-ton Heavy Force 300 Fusion Standard Engine, the Stone Rhino can achieve a maximum speed of 54 kilometers per hour, or 5 movement points in the tabletop game. What this means is it can keep up with most other 100-ton battle mechs, or other slow-moving assault mechs like itself. It's also still fast enough that it might be able to escape a bad situation, if it is being covered by friendly forces. To add to its mobility, as mentioned prior, it has three Grand Thrust Mark V jump jets, allowing the Stone Rhino to traverse up to 90 meters by jumping, or three movement points in the tabletop game. This means that it can bypass obstacles such as hills, small buildings, or forests, and can reposition itself to favorable locations as needed. The biggest benefit to the Stone Rhino in all of this, though, is the fact that it is a standard engine that it has. This means it's less likely to receive critical hits on its engine as a whole, and it can likely stay in the fight longer, even after catastrophic damage to its side torsos. A common clan way to enhance physical protection is to add feral fibers to the hull of a mech in order to save weight. Much like its internal structure, the Stone Rhino once again bypasses this, and has standard armored plating. It comes with 18 tons of compound 12A standard plating, giving it 288 points of armor in-game. This is a very substantial level of protection, realistically only one ton less than an AS-7D Atlas, which is still very well armored. So there are no shortcomings here. As a clan assault mech, this machine can take a beating from incoming fire before it must worry about the state of the vehicle. Clan chassis also inherently have case systems built into them. So in this instance, should its unstable components on board be detonated through a critical hit, the damage will be restricted only to the location of the blast. This, along with its lack of XL engine technologies, means the Stone Rhino is very, very durable. Where the Stone Rhino truly shows its teeth, despite not taking any major weight-saving measures beyond double heat sinks, is in the realm of firepower. Built around two side-mounted Thunderstroke Series 2B Gauss rifles with four tons of ammunition between the two of them, the Rhino can deliver lethal attacks at long range, just like the Matar before it. Each of these cannons do 15 damage upon impact, which will either tear holes into enemy armored plating or can instantly perform a pilot kill on an enemy mech should they make contact with the target's head. These weapons cannot be ignored. They make an excellent central focus to the behemoth. To add to this deadly duo of cannons, the Stone Rhino installs two more vicious clan weapons to disrupt and destroy lighter targets. But these are fantastic because of the power of clan technologies. These arm-mounted weapons come in the form of the Stone Rhino's twin Colibri Delta Series Large Pulse Lasers. This pair of pulse lasers go almost as far as the Gauss Rifles themselves and receive significant bonuses to hit in-game. They also still hit hard, doing as much damage as an Inner Sphere PPC, able to punch holes and able to rip into lighter targets that attempt to engage it with spot-on abilities to hit. These large pulse lasers are a major addition to the weapon's complement on board. Their being arm-mounted means that this gigantic mech can also pivot and fire them on a wider field of range in an attempt to dissuade 
or disrupt flankers and back attackers. Finally, the last component of this deadly array is its close range Chi series small pulse laser, which is mounted in the head of this giant. This is great for dealing with infantry assets, or mechs foolish enough to push to close ranges with this Gauss and large pulse laser blasting destroyer. In total, the Behemoth has an assembly of weapons which strike very hard. Originally envisioned as an impenetrable, plodding titan, bearing a striking resemblance to an alien life form, the Stone Rhino, despite its primitive internal systems, is a giant in more ways than just its size. It is still mobile thanks to its jump jets. It is exceptionally well armored, and it can deliver deadly hammer blows on its opposition from afar and in close. Were there more clan assault mechs like the Stone Rhino, ironically, the Inner Sphere would have performed much more poorly during the invasion, I suspect. Of course, in game it has a battle value of over 3,000 due to its mass and Gauss rifles. In universe, it is only approximately 10 million sea bills in value, however. This means that one could acquire two and a half stone rhinos for the price of one Madcap Prime. While this wouldn't necessarily be a force you'd want to build around, it shows that simplicity works just on cost alone. This makes it all the more ironic that Clan Smoke Jaguar built so few of these battle tested behemoths. Essentially, the stone rhino is a solid, simple, durable design that will, with primitive brute force, break the back of even some of the most noteworthy assault mechs with more advanced equipment. Its fundamentals as a design are just solid overall. In the century of warfare since its introduction, its gigantic feet striding over the battlefield, the Stone Rhino has been a terror for enemy mechs, tanks, and infantry alike. The baseline Rhino is still seen on the battlefields of the Il Clan era even, because simplicity works. Inside of the territories settled by the exiles of the Star League, in the prosperity of the Golden Century and shortly after, the clans would begin to politically split between two rising ideologies. One group would become known as the Crusaders, and had such notable, dedicated clans following it such as Clan Smoke Jaguar and Clan Jade Falcon. Alternatively, there were Wardens, with notable followers such as Clan Wolf and Coyote. Truth be told, however, near the start of these political movements, in and around the 30th century, more clans would be weighted towards being Crusaders than Wardens. In the year 3000, the Crusader clans, headed by Clan Ghost Bear at the time, would propose the invasion of the Inner Sphere to liberate the people from the tyranny of the Great Houses and to bring about the restoration of the Star League, as the great founder had wished for them to do. In essence, they would invade to save the people from themselves, and apparently believing that life expectancies beyond 60 were somehow inhumane. This proposed assault, however, would be prevented with the intervention of Clan Wolf. Not just trying to prevent the invasion for their political views, but pointing out that they knew next to nothing about the Inner Sphere. Con Curlin Ward would make a counter-proposal that instead, the clan send a unit mostly comprised of Freebirth Warriors into the Inner Sphere, concealing their origins by feigning being mercenaries, in order to gather intelligence on the Great Houses and the situation at large, as well as gathering information about their cultures, militaries, technological standings, and political dispositions. To invade without any of this data would be folly. Thus, the Dragoon Compromise was conceived, which resulted in some vicious disputes leading to several trials. But inevitably, the Wolves would be the ones to form the unit, or at least the lion's share of it. 
The Freeborn brothers Jamie and Joshua Wolf would be the commanders, and the soldiers and mech warriors assigned to it would be specifically trained in the old ways of warfare of the Star League, in order to better conceal themselves amongst other Inner Sphere mercenary units. But there were Trueborn clan warriors who would accompany them as well, including the ever-famous Natasha Kerensky, but the Black Widow was far from the only one. Even as the Dragoons entered the Inner Sphere, cleverly taking contracts in order to conceal but also exercise their mission, they would fight across the Capellan Confederation, Free Worlds League, Lyran Commonwealth, and later on, on behalf of the Dragon, into the Federated Sons. In all of that, there would be chosen, true-born clan warriors at the side of their Freebirth counterparts. One such true-born warrior, a man named Gordon Zed, who was truly named Gordon Zalman, would make it into the history books for a very different reason than his peers. Zalman had been a blood-named warrior of Clan Steel Viper, and history doesn't know much about him beyond the fact that he achieved a blood name, but also that he would be a part of Alpha Regiment within the Wolf's Dragoons. What made Gordon unique in the Inner Sphere, even outside of his true-born lineage, was the battle mech he was known for piloting across the Third Succession War, until the cusp of the fourth one. That was, Zalman would be piloting a downgraded stone rhino. Jamie Wolf, head of the Wolf's Dragoons, had made several errors while procuring battle mechs for the mission into the Inner Sphere. First, the Dragoons would bring some rare artifacts from the Star League era, long extinct designs, or machines which had incidentally never been in the Inner Sphere at any point. An example of the former would be bringing the Annihilator back to the Inner Sphere. An example of the latter would be bringing the clan-born Imp with them as well. But the most remarkable battle mech which Jamie brought, by accident to be clear, was Zalman's Stone Rhino, which had already been locally dubbed the Behemoth when first named by Inner Sphere pilots that would feel the wrath of this terrifying battle mech. Whenever Gordon Zed marched onto the field with this enormous mech, panic swept through the opposition of the Wolstergoons. An unknown, terrifying-looking battle mech, seemingly bigger than any contemporary, would be at the head of many of the assault breakthroughs when Alpha Regiment needed him, and he'd never be alone. Lieutenant William Fish would command the lance he was a part of from his Shogun, while Sergeant Demi Bannock would provide long-range LRM support and direct fire from their Stalker. Finally, Sal Field, another mech warrior veteran, would pilot a Goliath into battle alongside him. This lance was a part of Branson's company, and was an elite and veteran formation within the already remarkable Alpha Regiment. Gordon and his behemoth, and the unit he was with for that matter, would survive major engagements like the raid on Stike in late 3006 and early 3007. In the opening of the fight over the mech production world, Alpha Regiment battered an entire battalion into molten slag. He and his behemoth would fight in the infamous Battle of New Aragon, participating in the flanking of the main Capellan line. The battle would end with the crushing defeat of the Confederation, but also would end up creating a longer-term problem for the Wolstergoons as it was on this battlefield that the rivalry between Waco's Rangers and the Wolstergoons would begin, when Zeta Battalion killed Colonel Wayne Waco's son, John Waco. This would just be one of the victories the Dragoons would acquire, however, but the Capellans would eventually plot their own revenge on the Dragoons, utilizing McCarran's armored cavalry, though this wouldn't change the fact that the next employer for the Dragoons would be the Confederation itself. This contract would result in the Confederation turning its attention to its less stable neighbor, House Merrick, or the Free Worlds League. Unfortunately for the Dragoons, this contract resulted in their fighting under the banner of Anton Merrick's Rebellion, including the bloody battle against the 4th Regulan Hussars on Vanra. The Dragoons would also face a horrible betrayal by Anton Merrick himself, as he would seemingly kill Joshua Wolf. Jamie Wolf's brother and co-commander of the entire venture after trouble between the unit and their employer's ally. Joshua was also the lover of Natasha Kerensky, and she would see to it that her lover was avenged by killing Anton himself. 
Following their orders to continue to observe the inner sphere, they would position themselves next to fight for their previous enemy, Captain General Janos Marek of the Free Worlds League. When fighting for the Eagle, the Dragoons would be used as a lance to pierce the heart of their ancient and most hated rival, the Lyran Commonwealth. One of the most ambitious raids in history would be embarked by the Dragoons on behalf of their new masters in the League after several successful, smaller operations, which was to attack the mega-industrial world of Hesphorus. This saw Alpha Regiment used extensively, and the Behemoth reared its massive head here as well, playing a role in the heavy, slogging battles against prepared defenses of the Lyran Commonwealth's armed forces. Here too, Gordon and his mech would survive, even though the battle would be inevitably lost. The unit would leverage this battle, having proven their mettle, for them to acquire their contract with the Lyran Commonwealth. The Behemoth would then travel with the Dragoons to Dramini for their first battle against the Dragon on behalf of House Steiner, fighting against the famous Second Sword of Light Regiment. But all of these battles, and many more to be clear, would not prepare the Behemoth, the Stone Rhino, for its final battle. After taking on their contract with the Draconis Combine, and seeing it turn completely awry, after being betrayed by the Coordinator in almost every way, the Wolf's Dragoons would have to fight the very unit they'd been paired with to train, the Ryukin. The bonds forged between the two sides were strong, making the battle brother versus brother in many ways. Tetsuhara Monobu, the leader of the Ryukin, would lead the fight to preserve his honor on the world of misery, regardless of the true friendship that he had forged with Jamie Wolf. The sad and bitter truth was, he was betrayed even before the battle himself, as it was staged for him to be forced to fight the Dragoons as a part of a plot by a rival within the Combine, and by the coordinator Karita Takashi himself. The Battle of Misery in 3028 is one of the most legendary in the history of Battletech. In this savage conflict between two elite forces, the Dragoons would have the upper hand throughout, through superior intelligence, as well as through superior battle mechs and overall fighting capabilities. But this did not mean they were without losses, and an incredibly high number of Dragoons were killed in action in the killing fields of the frozen hell that was Misery. The fate of the behemoth, the terror the Dragoons had unleashed upon unsuspecting spheroids, was decided in this nightmare of a battle as well. This one-off, shock and awe machine, and its pilot, Mech Warrior Zalman, would fight and die in this horrendous environment, along with the rest of his lance and most of his company. It's hard to imagine what it must have looked like. Its huge frame twisting and firing on incoming battle mechs as it was chipped away piece by piece by the Combine's elite. We know it went down in a blaze of glory, as the mech would be badly savaged before Gordon Zalman met his end within his longtime mount. The machine that saw him through almost two decades of high intensity battles in the inner sphere. The giant fell the monster that plagued every house over the course of years, was slain by the dragon. After the battle, this enormous hulk would be recovered by the Combine, who would examine its advanced wreckage in near bewilderment. The Combine would never be able to replicate it, even with its downgraded technologies. But all the same, it was a prize to be had, something for their own engineers and scientists to examine and document, and as a trophy against their now most hated foe. The Battle of Misery and its consequences would not be forgotten, and the Wolf's Dragoons would have their revenge in the Fourth Succession War. But unfortunately for the Inner Sphere, there would be more children of Kerensky on their way, and they would not be there to play at being mercenaries. They would come as conquerors. Heavily modified by the Wolf's Dragoons and the clans before entering service in the Inner Sphere, Gordon Zalman's infamous behemoth, dubbed the BHN-6H, was a terror on the battlefields of the Succession Wars. Despite having some of its drawbacks, 
from having to sacrifice its advanced kind technologies for inner sphere equipment at the time. Funnily enough, this model of the hulking behemoth seems to have more in common with Ameris's folly than it does with the stone rhino itself. To begin with, the mech is forced to reduce its engine from a 300 standard fusion engine down to a 200 fusion engine of unknown type. This creates the major drawback of lowering the speed of the behemoth down to 32 kilometers per hour, which can have major repercussions for the machine consequently. First, this places the mech back into the difficult position of the original Matar, which is a poor place to be in. It is somewhat more forgiving during the succession wars, however, due to a more limited volume of artillery, as well as generally poor tactics used during this era of warfare. It also maintains its ability to jump as well. Still, its mobility is that of an urban mech, and therefore is extraordinarily disappointing. Next, it replaces out its clan double heat sinks, and instead installs 12 tons of single heat sinks on board, giving the behemoth an almost outlandish 22 cooling per turn. This cooling is needed, however, to keep the behemoth running relatively cool in this age of warfare. For protection, it has the same 288 points of armor as the Stone Rhino, which is more than impressive for the Succession Wars era, and is only regularly outmatched by an Atlas at this time. Firepower is where the BNH-6H still packs a deadly punch. It replaces out its Gauss rifles for a pair of AC-10 autocannons, with four tons of ammunition in total, giving it 20 rounds of fire. These guns, for the Succession Wars era, are exceptionally dangerous. To back these up, it replaces out its large pulse lasers with a pair of Inner Sphere PPCs, which deliver the same damage and still reach out to longer ranges. Finally, its small pulse laser is replaced by a small laser. In essence, it is as heavily gunned as an Annihilator, while having six more tons of armor and a small amount of additional mobility, which honestly is not too bad. It's basically a superior Annihilator, in other words. This does make it a mediocre mech on the tabletop in many ways still, but on the battlefields of the Third Succession Wars, especially when no one could identify the mech or the weapons it had, and it seemingly was impenetrable to incoming fire, well, things start looking a little bit better. The Behemoth would have been a more than satisfactory piece to the Wolf's Dragoons, and its survival over the course of decades proves that. Countless Inner Sphere mech warriors would have seen this titanic form loom around a corner, or jump past a set of hills, before unloading its lethal array of weapon systems. Many would return fire into it, only for their attacks to be deflected away, or absorbed with a little issue, before they fell to the wrath of its extremely heavy guns. An imperfect tool for an imperfect age but a dangerous one all the same, made yet more dangerous by its pilot. The single greatest change in the history of the Inner Sphere at least after the fall of the Star League, would be the launching of Operation Revival, or as it is known broadly, the launching of the Clan Invasion. A tragic series of events would culminate in order for this to take place. Certain men and women would need to rise to prominence within the clans, but it also involved Comstar exploring the depths of the periphery in an attempt to chart the path of Kerensky's journey into the Great Beyond. These events would also lead to the Stone Rhino returning to the Inner Sphere once more, though this time in its true form, and as a part of the technologically sophisticated, brutal strike forces that would emerge from clan space. Just to be clear though, as this is important, it played a minimum role in the invasion itself through its framed usage and its arrival. Funnily enough, the creators of the Stone Rhino Clan Smoke Jaguar would play the single biggest role in the attack on the Inner Sphere taking place. The most important individual that would be responsible for the clan invasion from the clan side would be a man who rose to the ranks of Clan Smoke Jaguar like a force of nature, a warrior almost without equal, 
and a politician able to understand and appease his peers within Clan Smoke Jaguar, Leo of the Bloodhouse Showers would become Khan of the clan at the age of only 25. Even with youth being promoted amongst the clans, and disdain for older warriors who failed to achieve blood names within the clan, it is still remarkable that Leo would position himself, through trial and through politicking, to reach such a stunning height at such a young age. Khan Showers would have an intense rivalry with his wolf counterpart, Ulrich Kerensky. Unfortunately for him, he would be frustrated by a multitude of events, preventing him from acting on his true goal and ambition to strike the Inner Sphere. The Council would never acquire a consensus, and worse still, it was understood by many of the Crusaders that the Wolstergoons had apparently defected to the Inner Sphere during the 3020s, as their intelligence reports seemed to have simply halted at that time. This meant that the compromise between the clans, Warden and Crusader, had failed in the eyes of at least the Crusader portion of the Council. Yet there was still no immediate movements or calls for an attack on what was perceived to be the suffering masses of barbarians in the wreckage of the once proud Star League. But false fortune would favor Showers and his Crusader Elk with the arrival of a ship from the Inner Sphere, a dedicated explorer vessel from the other Star League descendants. Comstar would arrive at the jump point near Huntress, homeworld of Clan Smoke Jaguar. The vessel would be seized upon by the Jaguars with haste, preventing its escape and capturing its crew. They would interrogate the captured Comstar crew, as well as using drugs and other forms of coercion on them to obtain all the information that they could as to the activities of the Inner Sphere since most of the Council had been left blind since the Dragoons ceased reporting. What was discovered, and then filtered through the political ideological lens of Clan Smoke Jaguar before being delivered to the Grand Council, was that the Inner Sphere was not in the state of decay, decline, and collapse that the Dragoons had originally reported. Instead, the Comstar operatives had provided a very different series of facts that seemed to demonstrate the contrary. The Inner Sphere's powers had discovered the Hell Memory Core. They were rebuilding their industries. And that said nothing of the military and political alliances that had started to form. The Concord of Captian was a loose alliance of the Free Worlds League, Draconis Combine, and Capellan Confederation, as well as being backed by Comstar. In conflict with these nations were the much more unified and centralized Federated Commonwealth a union of the Federated Sons and Lyran Commonwealth. While the clans expected the latter of these alliances to have more grit, Smoke Jaguar would have a much more chilling prediction from this data. Data they controlled, mind you. The Star League was going to reform without them. The clans, as well as the teachings of the great savior of mankind, Nicholas Karensky, would be excluded from this restored, imperfect Star League and it would be just as flawed and doomed as ever, whether it be formed by the Federated Commonwealth or its adversaries. Worse yet, the very existence of the outbound light was evidence that the Inner Sphere had the eventual capabilities to discover their location, and they had the ability to attack and invade them in the future. They were a threat. All of these arguments were more or less skewed to what Leo Showers had wanted. The Grand Council of the Clans would vote in favor of invading the Inner Sphere. Smoke Jaguar warriors were so enthusiastic over the idea that their Khan, their leader, had made this possible, that parades and celebrations were arranged across their worlds. The Jaguars not only achieved a great victory in the Council, they would soon achieve great, lasting, and crushing victories against the barbarians of the Inner Sphere. It would be Clan Smoke Jaguar that would have the honor of taking the homeworld of all mankind, Terra, at least in their minds. Leo Showers would become Ilkhan of the clans. Operation Revival would become the name of the campaign that would be unleashed upon the unsuspecting people of the Oberon Confederation, Free Rosselhaig Republic, Draconis Combine, and the Lyran half of the Federated Commonwealth. The clans would bid against one another as to who would have the honor of invading the Inner Sphere. 
Inevitably, the first clans to win this honor would be clans Jade Falcon, Ghost Bear, Wolf, and of course, Smoke Jaguar. Clans Ghost Bear, Jade Falcon, and Smoke Jaguar were at the forefront of being Crusader clans. And their participation not only made sense, but it was an honor. Clan Wolf's involvement was a combination of political necessity, given Nicholas Kerensky's genes were within the clan, but also as a punishment for their obstruction and hindrances against the goal of enacting Kerensky's vision. After monumental preparations were made, in the middle of June 3049, the final rousing speeches were given to the invasion fleet before the clans would return home. And in the minds of the Crusader clans, they would bring about the world which Nicholas Kerensky had perfected. They would bring these people the gift of a world that would be perfected by the ideas of Nicholas Kerensky. This powerful and seemingly unstoppable force would first be unleashed upon the periphery, where lone worlds which displayed any sign of resistance and the original Oberon Confederation would be absolutely annihilated in quick order before the first four clans began to move into their pre-assigned invasion corridors. The opening battle against these backwards, lonely worlds and poorly defended confederation were simply proof to most of these clans that the invasion would be one of ease. How wrong they were. Bloody battles would rage between the clans and their inner sphere opponents with increasing ferocity the longer the campaign went on. And the fighting became even more intense with the more worlds they took or put at risk. Mercenaries, house units, and local militias fought back, despite having equipment 500 years inferior to their enemies' technologies. But these battles, piercing into the soft outer flesh of the inner sphere, were mostly waged by the clan's most sophisticated battle mechs, their Omnimech forces. Fast, powerful, and using almost all of the most advanced materials available to them, they would strike world after world in a near endless blitzkrieg, rolling like thunder over their adversaries. In these battles, for the most part, the Stone Rhino would not be able to participate, even with the fact that most clans had them available in their inventories. This did not make it impossible to see them during revival, as from time to time, the shadow of the Colossus may loom over unsuspecting defenders of a world. It's just that it was simply not a frontline mech. Instead, trapped rear guards, resistant cells and insurgents, or counterattacking units, or raiding mercenaries, would find themselves more likely facing down the Titan Ameris dreamt of. Regardless, so infrequent was its usage that the behemoth was sparsely mentioned or accounted for by the Inner Sphere during this initial terrifying assault on the Combine, Free Rossel Hague Republic, or Federated Commonwealth. The first real displays of its power would arrive before the truce between the Inner Sphere and the clans, in one of the most storied battles in history. All the same, planets fell in the advance of the clan's first line mechs. Advanced Omni mechs, the preference of frontline galaxies, could be refit and redeployed more easily and were always able to hit faster and harder, weight for weight, ton for ton, the machines like the Stone Rhino. They would break the back of seemingly any defender in their path. While on the ground, the Free Rosselhig Republic suffered the most, though often they offered bitter resistance. The Republic would see almost no victories in the battlefield itself against the invaders, even as their newly won homeland was stripped away from them. World by world, Clan Wolf and Clan Ghost Bear to be clear, eviscerated them. Though, as I mentioned, fighting was hard. Especially given that they were crafty defenders who used clan martial culture against them eventually as they discovered how it worked. Against these alien invaders, the vaunted armed forces of the Federated Commonwealth, built up by the legendary Hans Davian, and supplied with premium battle mechs and superb commanders, would be battered and shattered by Clan Jade Falcon time after time. Mercenaries hired by the state fared little better, including the remarkable 12th Star Guard, a four-regiment legacy unit from the Star League, which was utterly destroyed in the invasion. And what happened to the Draconis Combine in the opening stages of the war, at the hands of Clan Smoke Jaguar no less, was absolute carnage. 
combine units were utterly savaged, their honor tarnished, and their spirits seemingly broken. So badly were the Draconis Combine mustard soldiery mauled by the Jaguars that many of the smoked Jaguars felt disappointment. They'd wanted battles worthy of song and personal glories and honor. Often the defenders of the Combine were, in a word, slaughtered by the invaders. On all fronts, it seemed the clans were unstoppable. Until they weren't. The clan forces invading people they dubbed as primitive barbarians, unfortunately were set to discover that their opponents would overcome the shock of being attacked by new, powerful war machines as the war ground on. In addition to this, insurgencies and disorder behind clan lines would begin to accelerate. Worse still, a sense of invincibility permeated the clan ranks, and it more specifically fostered a sense of superiority to such a point where clan mech warriors and commanders would begin to make severe mistakes. If only because they'd lost anything reflecting respect for their enemy's cunning, guile, determination, or even capabilities. In the Battle of Walcott, the Gunji no Kanri of the Draconis Combine, Karita Theodore, one of the greatest commanders in the history of the Combine, would fight a battle of deception and cunning, preparing their victory beforehand. Using terrain features to their advantage, in this case a tropical marsh and jungle, and mining it for good measure, the DCMS would try to lure their opponents, Clan Smoke Jaguar, into close-range fights. Smoke Jaguar, through their arrogance, accepted Bachal in this region. Kurita Hohiro, the son of Theodore himself, would be the one to set up the plot through direct communications. The Jaguar's Beta Galaxy would attack in the agreed environment, and would inevitably fall into the teeth of the Draconis Combine's defenders. Ambushes by vehicles and infantry played a major role in creating havoc for the Jaguars as well, all while they were hammered by Combine mechs. The result was a complete failure for Beta Galaxy. Through their arrogance in accepting the terms of the battle, as well as assuming an easy victory, it would only spell their utter defeat, and most humiliatingly, they would be forced to surrender. Walcott would hold, not just in this battle, but for the rest of the invasion. This marked the first true victory over the clans in the war. Twycross would be the next disaster for the attackers, the battle taking place on a world which had already fallen to Clan Jade Falcon prior. The Federated Commonwealth had been fortunate enough that a contingent of their forces had slipped away from the planet after defending it resulting in additional intelligence about enemy dispositions. A political and strategic decision was made by the Federated Commonwealth to launch a counteroffensive, and Twycross, for a multitude of strategic reasons, was chosen as their point of attack. What unfolded would be an action important enough that the heir to the throne of the Federated Commonwealth, Victor Ian Steiner Davian, would be a part of it. The AFFC and the Kelhounds landed on World, catching their falcon enemies flat-footed, using the planet's natural environment to their advantage. Despite tough fighting, the Jade Falcons would be overwhelmed. Though there was a catch. The Falcon Guards, an elite unit, would be stationed on world, unbeknownst to Federated Commonwealth Command. They would nearly, in fact, get the opportunity to strike back against the invaders, and potentially shatter the sword of the Steiner Davian counterattack. Were it not for the fact that they were lured by the great Kai Allard Liao into a duel next to what was called the Great Gash, a major geographical feature that would collapse on the entire formation due to the cunning of Kai himself, Twycross would be a victory which the Federated Commonwealth needed. Other battles followed, both in space and on the ground. The Free Rosselhig Republic would disable the Wolf's flagship, the Dire Wolf, killing Ilkhan Leo Showers in the process for starters. A new Ilkhan, Ulrich Kerensky, would be put in charge as a result, as the campaign resumed. Attrition had begun to take its toll on all the clans, including Ghost Bear and the Wolves, despite not facing significant setbacks, like their Smoke Jaguar and Jade Falcon counterparts. 
the Jaguars would continue to launch waves of new attacks, all while being forced to work with one of the newly activated reserve clans, the Nova Cats. The Falcons would find new allies with the Steel Vipers, the two clans immediately being at one another's throats, while Diamond Shark were pseudo-activated to help the Ghost Bears, though they were not permitted to do more than be glorified garrisons in the rear. These call-ups were largely due to the Wolves looking to politically alter the course of the invasion, though it wouldn't work out of the gate entirely. The last great battle before the trial on Tukiyat would be the Battle of Luthien. The Smoke Jaguars, increasingly looking like a spent force, would rally their troops for an attack on the Dracomas Combine on their homeworld of Luthien, in hopes of dealing a death blow to their opponent. The Jaguars' lack of focus on their own economic resources was now displaying that despite being a very mighty clan at first glance, they were not able to continuously sustain operations, and they began having troubles replacing losses or expanding their manpower pools. Operation Dragon Slayer would be a joint operation with their Novacat allies. Over five clan galaxies would collide with 12 inner sphere regiments, including the DCMS, Wolfstragoons, and Kelhounds. Fighting would be vicious, and it would be contested at every turn as both sides positioned to achieve a great victory. It would be the Battle of the Kato Gucci Valley that would decide this brutal engagement. The Jaguars and Novacats would be found wanting as the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery and the Wolstergoons broke the back of the combined clan force. The Novacats would quit the field first. Stubbornly, the Jaguars held on longer, making their losses all the more severe. In the aftermath of this historic setback, Smoke Jaguar, which was already struggling to keep up with attrition and losses, would be exposed as being much shallower than anyone expected, both in the clans and in the Inner Sphere. The rulers of Terra, Comstar, would realize the full intention of the clan's invasion. This would lead to them coming to an agreement between the new Ilkhan Ulrich Kerensky and Presenter Marshal Thought the latter operating on behalf of Primus Waterley. Comstar and their Comguards would challenge the clans to a competition. If they lost, Terra would be taken by the clans. And should they have won, the clans would have to halt their invasion for 15 years. Both men prepared themselves and their respective forces for the battles ahead, though in the case of the Comguard, they were a united front. To frame the problems the clans faced, even prior to the battle. We have to look at the overall state of these organizations. The circumstances and statuses of these clans would also lead to very different material realities for the composition of their forces as well, on the surface of the fabled war zone that had been selected, the world of Tukiyid. This situation was perhaps where the Stone Rhino began to make its most prominent appearance, from the start of the invasion up until this point. In the case of the clan's preparedness, they were most certainly collectively not in fighting shape for the campaign, and there were severe cracks beginning to show in the clan forces after two years of grueling warfare. Every clan which had started the invasion, without exception, was now beginning to show some level of fatigue. The wolves so far had performed the best in their theater of operations, but even they would experience losses in manpower and materials on the road to May of 3052. By comparison, however, the Jade Falcons, and even more so the Smoke Jaguars, were in vastly inferior spaces. Clan Smoke Jaguar, indeed before the Battle of Tukiyid, had been badly mauled, and was now hollowed out as a fighting force in many respects. Clan Jade Falcon, while not being as maimed as their Jaguar's counterpart, had taken serious losses through both attrition and through the body blow the Federated Commonwealth had dealt to it on Twycross. The Ghost Bears were slower and more methodical in their advances on the Inner Sphere, and they had performed much more closely to their wolf counterparts in terms of losses, but they were still feeling the weight of attrition on their own galaxies. 
The reserve clans, which had been activated only recently before the battle, were too not left unscathed, at least to some extent. But their position preceding the engagement was almost more important than the original four invading clans. If only because they would be the freshest troops. Their contributions would be decisive for the clans in either victory or defeat. Ideally, these clans would have sought information from their comrades in some way to adjust their own approaches or as to not underestimate inner sphere tactics. But sadly, the clans were inherently adversarial to one another in order to achieve the most honor, and this vital level of cooperation didn't even exist between the more experienced, original invading clans. Even between these initial clans, there was an intense rivalry which also hindered their willingness to work together. Clan Steel Viper had its own bouts and run-ins with the Federated Commonwealth, at least, as they entered the same invasion theater as the Jade Falcons. To show up their Jade Falcon allies, it would be the Steel Vipers who would retake Twycross for the clans. Inter-clan fighting would also take place between the two, prior to Tukiad, due to disputes emerging between the rival organizations. Although the Vipers hadn't lost anywhere near the same amount of men and materials as their Falcon counterparts, at least so far, they were both not a fresh force. Nor were they as informed as to how the Inner Sphere practiced warfare. This would be ultimately a major contributor to their own undoing in the Inner Sphere, but most especially on the surface of Tukiad. Clan Novacat shouldered a significantly larger burden in their own operating zone. Working with Clan Smoke Jaguar, they'd faced significantly more attrition as the Combine worlds resisted occupation, and worse still, they had to put up with more direct confrontations with their Inner Sphere counterparts. The Novacats would also suffer at the hands of the Combine and mercenary forces on Luthien, losing a galaxy's worth of equipment and personnel before they were routed from the field. The cats would have something to prove on Tukiad, and this unfortunately played into a terrible outcome for them. The Diamond Sharks had been largely an untested force in the campaign, having only just entered the Ghost Bears occupation region, and unfortunately for them, they still hadn't been fully activated to fight, in essence turning them into a glorified garrison and reserve force. They would have much to prove on Tukiad, especially as they took such pride in their own fighting prowess. Their inexperience on the Inner Sphere battlefields and their eagerness to prove themselves would be demonstrated to just be too much for them. What's most important about Tukiat and why it plays into the Stone Rhino and its full display to the Inner Sphere is that these haggard, tired clan forces would be placed into a less than ideal situation. Normally clan offensive operations rely on their most cutting edge designs, especially for their premier units, such as their frontline galaxies. This would mean that most clans Alpha Galaxy, for example, would be outfitted exclusively with clan Omnimex. The rate of war within the Inner Sphere, however, had meant that Omnimex had been lost at a very high rate and even with replacements having been planned for, they could not keep up with the general burn rate. This concluded in the less than ideal reality that the clans in the run up to and the participation in the Battle of Tukiad, that many of their warriors would not have access to their preferred battle mechs. On Tukiad, there would be a higher rate of documenting second line machines. There are famous instances of mechs such as the Warhammer 2C and others making an appearance here too, but most notably, in multiple forces, the enormous monster built by Clan Smoke Jaguar, the Stone Rhino, would rear its enormous frame, and it would participate in the battle in a way it simply rarely would have under normal conditions. These slow-striding machines and other second-line mechs would be set against the Comguards in some of the highest intensity fighting seen in the Inner Sphere since the time of the First Succession Wars. Examples would be seen in Clan Jade Falcon, Steel Viper, Smoke Jaguar, and Ghost Bear, where each of these venerable, storied war machines would lock horns with their free birth adversaries. 
despite their reverence in many sense as battle mechs, and though each one often had their own legends or battles documented for it, the Stone Rhino was hardly the first choice for many frontline pilots. Any battle mech that wasn't an Omnimech was viewed as lesser. But all the same, these vehicles and their second line counterparts would have a vital role to play in the battle. The Stone Rhino was well suited to the conflict all the same. It was heavily gunned, heavily armored, and had a simplified logistics chain to keep it in the battle, unlike many of his Omnimech peers. But regardless of its virtues, any weapon must be used wisely by those who would wield it for them to achieve success. The Stone Rhino would do its part in the battle, but would its pilots? Would their commanding officers? Unfortunately for the clans, and unfortunately for the pilots of the Stone Rhino, this battle would display that the clans were in fact dysfunctional, and struggled between one another, and even internally, over their own perceived glories. By contrast, the Calm Guards, despite being a relatively green force, were dedicated behind one purpose. They also had a unified command structure that was very capably assembled. With that common goal and purpose, often rooted in religious ideology, much like the clans, but one with a much more cooperative spirit about it internally, they would fight bravely against these technological horrors, and the most brutal and vicious threat to the inner sphere since the time of Stefan Amaris himself. The Comguard would prove, through courage, determination, cooperation, and leadership, that the inner sphere could fight the clans and win, even in stand-up battles. The Stone Rhino would be there in the devilish encounter with Clan Steel Viper, where the Vipers were lured, through their pride, into an obvious ambush. Entering a region where they would be saturated in boiling mud, as well as low ground, the Calm Guards would bludgeon the Steel Vipers in this environment, in a bloody exchange, but one where the Calm Guards could afford their losses and ruthlessly continued the meat grinder especially once the Viper's supplies were cut. Inevitably, the meat grinder was just too much, even as the Vipers crossed the battleground of what is now dubbed the Devil's Bath, in what they thought would be their victory. Fresh Comguard divisions arrived and collided with the tired, damaged, and out-of-time Vipers. At the end of the last day of fighting between the two, Steel Viper officially surrendered and quit the field. With 25% of their ground forces killed in action, Steel Viper's Khan would resign in disgrace after the battle. Funnily enough, if the Vipers had the tolerance to accept higher losses and fight on, the Vipers may have actually won, but there just wasn't a will to do so. Their capitulation ensured the defeat of the clans on Tukiad, seemingly more than any others. The now famous image of Tukiad made in recent times displays a stone rhino engaged in a life or death struggle with a Comguard Black Knight, as the Vipers are being ambushed. It is unknown what happened to this mech or its pilot. Clan Diamond Shark viewed themselves as being highly disciplined and being a highly elite organization, while Comstar viewed them as being inexperienced and unprepared. The latter proved correct. The Sharks underbid in an extreme way before being faced with two full armies as their enemies. Their understrength but elite frontline galaxy and their second line Omega galaxy would be utterly annihilated in the coming battle. The defeat was so severe on Tukiad that the clan faced what amounts to an internal coup, permanently changing its culture and governance. 
The Novacats decided they wished to display their military prominence by hot dropping into the battle on their dropships. The Comguards interdicted these vessels and even caused the catastrophic destruction of the Cat's Maw, the Alpha Galaxy's command dropship. The battle would be stiff from here on out, with a brutal back and forth between the Novacats and the Comguards. Unfortunately for the Novacats, they became slow to react to the changing battlefield situations as they pressed on, and unlike on Luthien, they had not made the call to retreat until it was too late. Only three stars of battle mechs walked off of Tukiid intact, in essence causing them to lose nearly three full galaxies of soldiers. These were the catastrophes of the less experienced clans on Tukiid. Of all of the clans during this fight, they needed to perform the most. Their absolute implosion and complete defeats ensured Tukiid would end in a defeat for the clans as a whole. The Ghost Bears fought hard with frontline and secondline galaxies, and managed to obtain a minor victory. What's interesting is the Ghost Bears themselves seem to have learned the most from the invasion so far, at least amongst the Crusaders. They didn't attempt to bid away their forces for glory, they didn't really follow Zelbringen during the battle, because of their experience of having fought the Free Rosselhaig Republic so far, as they assumed that the Comguards would use the same Desgra tactics and they didn't care for the most prestigious targets. They only cared to show up and win the actual battle. They would accept the compromise of this marginal victory because it was pragmatic. Their own position was not as concrete as one might believe, and the Comguards could still, in theory, defeat them. So when the minor victory was proposed to them, they simply reached out and took it. The other factor behind them accepting this victory early on, rather than pushing for a full one, was that Smoke Jaguar and Novacat had already been absolutely crushed, and they viewed these other clans as their rivals at the time. Their defeat made Ghost Bear's victory, no matter how slight, very rewarding. The Ghost Bears, despite using frontline galaxies in battle, did use a selection of second-line mechs in the engagements, out of a combination of necessity and seeing the strengths of these particular models. Clan Jade Falcon would fight to a draw, but only due to the legendary Aiden Pride in his unit. Truthfully though, it was mostly a draw to appeal to their egos. They only briefly held one of the cities they needed to take. Their great claim would be the severe damage which they had inflicted upon the Comguards. The Falcons too deployed the Stone Rhino, and to some effect, with it adorning the original cover of Fass's Tukiid sourcebook. Given the Jade Falcon's heinous, bloody confrontation with the Comguards, it's not hard to imagine that this machine, and others like it, forced the Comguards to pay a heavy price for confronting it. Clan Wolf would be the only clan to achieve an outright victory against the Comguards. And convincingly so. There is some speculation that the Comguards hadn't wanted to put the resources into beating the Wolves, hoping their Warden opponents would be victorious in order to give them credibility. There are also others who point out that the wolves were the most prepared for the battle, and inflicted enormous damage, while receiving comparatively fewer losses than any other clan that had stuck out the battle. In other words, not quitting the field early, like the Vipers had. The creators of the Stone Rhino, those who fielded it most frequently, and would be amongst those who would deploy it on the killing grounds of Tukiid would perhaps face one of the worst fates in the battle. The only initially invading clan to perform as poorly as a reserve clan was in fact Clan Smoke Jaguar. It was also extremely ironic that Clan Smoke Jaguar, the biggest advocates for the invasion, were now the greatest victims of it seemingly. While Ghost Bear, Wolf, and Jade Falcon had many veterans of the campaign to help them during their struggles with the Comguards, an experience that could be internally used Smoke Jaguar, unfortunately for them, had a huge burn rate prior to the battle itself. Walcott had cost them dearly, and had lost them an experienced commander as well. Luthien had been a military disaster for the Jaguars too, losing countless experienced, battle-hardened troops who had an understanding of the Inner Sphere's way of war. What's worse is the material loss, both in men and machines, had to be replaced at a much higher rate than other clans. Clan warriors are also often stubborn, 
and certainly don't take receiving lessons from unsuccessful counterparts well. This, as a whole, as well as from senior leadership learning nothing from their prior mistakes, was an absolute disaster waiting to happen. Clan Smoke Jaguar would underbid in order to receive glory, but also frankly in order to preserve their badly wounded Tumen. One third of their potential forces were as a consequence not able to be deployed. The Comguards would also seemingly kill Lincolnosis in the fighting around the Dinju Pass, as well as killing the Jaguar's Loremaster. Osis, as it would turn out, would survive, but he would not participate further in the battle. In the fighting around the Resisi River, Sakon Sarah Weaver would be killed in action in a miserable swamp after three days of intense fighting. The Jaguars had been the first to land. They'd been the most fervent supporters of the invasion. Tukyid would see a full third of their deployed forces killed in action. It was another costly, destructive catastrophe the clan could not afford. It was also a political reversal it equally couldn't afford. In and amongst the swamps of the Resisi River, there would lay stone rhinos, left among the hulks of the clan's Omnimex and second line forces, half submerged and destroyed. The enormous Goliath's failure on Tukyid can be seen as analogous to the clan titan that had turned its full fury to the inner sphere. The behemoth was poorly suited for the kinds of environments the Comguards forced them to fight in, for the most part, just as the clans themselves were poorly suited for the battles which the Inner Sphere forced them to fight during Operation Revival. Clan military doctrines and teachings throughout the invasion proved to be an absolute failure, and Tukiad only further solidified this reality. The Stone Rhino, being employed into the Devil's Bath, or into the Resisi swamps, or any of these other nightmarish scenarios, was the embodiment of foolishness. The mechs were built for an entirely different mode of warfare, even when it was the Matar prior to the birth of the clans. Tukyid would deliver many lessons to the clans which survived it, and many would transform, the most radical outcomes being that of Clan Diamond Shark and Clan Steel Viper. Clan Smoke Jaguar might have seen the opportunity to change and adapt itself, were it given the chance. Built during approximately the same time frame as the original, the Behemoth 6, or Stone Rhino 6, is one of the primary alternative versions of the Stone Rhino constructed by Clan Smoke Jaguar shortly after the original configuration made its debut, and it has a radically different profile as compared to its peer. This monster, despite being less frequently seen compared to the original, would have been placed in second-line galaxies deployed to Tukiad, or other preceding or future engagements. Even front-line galaxies might have seen these, depending on the material situation of the clan in question in the fabled battle. Built for speed and close-range dueling, Ironically, this mech replaces out its entire weapons package, as well as its very engine. A new 400XL power plant is installed, giving the mech a maximum speed of 64 kilometers per hour, though it sadly can only jump 60 meters in this configuration. Its armor plating is upgraded to ferrofibrous as well, in an attempt to offset some of its weight, and providing it with more protection than an atlas. In essence, it's a fast, 100 ton heavily armored brick which can be launched at its enemies. And the reason why I would call it a brick is because of its new weapons configuration, if one could call it that, as it is simply 14 clan medium pulse lasers, with 7 in each torso. To describe this as anything beyond shocking is to do a disservice to anyone forced to face such a beast. Each of these weapons goes further than a traditional inner sphere medium laser, 12 hexes in the tabletop game in this case and hits for a shocking 7 points of damage, almost as much as an Inner Sphere large laser. What makes this truly deadly though, is that they are supremely accurate due to their pulse bonuses, making them too easier to hit targets at any range bracket. What's even more remarkable is that each laser only generates 4 heat. This does mean an Alpha Strike would be supremely hard on the machine, as it only has 36 cooling capacity, but frankly, it has no ammunition on board anyway, to risk an ammunition explosion. 
with a shocking potential 100 damage from all of these lasers combined. In many instances, a risky Alpha Strike may be worth it for the Stone Rhino 6 to embark on, especially at close ranges, where its ability to hit is almost default. It has a single ER small laser in its head as well, in order to say it can do over 100 damage, rather than simply 98. This hulking, relatively quick-moving monster should be feared by everyone who sees it. Even just trying to put it down with firepower before it makes contact with the enemy may be impossible. Have pity for Comguard on Tukiid, or any mercenaries and other prior probing attacks prior to Tukiid that met this absolute horror show of a battle mech, as this thing probably has more in common with Michael Myers than it does with a battle mech for most of its opposing pilots. Modeled seemingly at least in the real world on another inner sphere designed turned clan war machine, namely the Supernova, the Stone Rhino 7 once more is a product of the pre-invasion era of the clans, and was manufactured by clan Smoke Jaguar. This once more is an example of using the hulking frame of the Stone Rhino, as well as its simple body plan to get maximized results from clan energy systems. Funnily enough, this model was officially built for space operations, but can be dangerous in any environment it is placed in, given the hellish waves of damage it can do under most circumstances. Removing the Gauss rifles on board from the original, this battle mech uses the saved weight from that to invest in near insane amounts of double heat sinks on board, mounting a total of 26 double heat sinks into the body, taking up most of its critical space. The 7 can clear 52 heat per turn from the chassis, and it will definitely need to. Because with the remaining saved tonnage it has from the removed Gauss rifles, this Stone Rhino goes on to install three Clan ER large lasers, which go out to a shocking 25 hexes in game and hit as hard as an Inner Sphere PPC. This gives it a high level of sustainability on the battlefield, as it no longer is reliant on Gauss ammunition. In addition to this, it increases its range. This means that the Stone Rhino 7 is a fantastic, dedicated, long-range sniper that can shred its target before they reach effective range to counter-strike it. Terrain providing, of course. When combining its ER large lasers with its large pulse lasers, especially at medium range brackets, the Stone Rhino will do catastrophic levels of damage upon an Alpha Strike at any range potentially up to 50 damage, all done in sets of 10 across the enemy frame. More terrifying yet, it does this all for 56 heat, meaning that if stationary, it can fire this immense wave of large laser fire without suffering significant heat problems, at least for one turn. Beyond this, it's more or less a standard Stone Rhino. The Stone Rhino 7 is extremely dangerous, and would make a fantastic accounting of itself on the battlefields of the Inner Sphere when it was available, such as in the Battle of Tukiid. Although Tukiid would be one of the most noteworthy series of appearances and deployments of the Stone Rhino during the clan invasion, its real rise to prominence would begin on the march towards the year 3055, where it would be fully documented as a part of Technical Readout 3055. All was not quiet after the defeat of the clans, and the 15-year ceasefire which was put into place. Mercenaries, pirates, Irregular forces as well as house units would raid into clan space, testing the defenses of their enemies, all while also attempting to steal invaluable clan technologies, or to disrupt their occupation of inner sphere space. This would also be where the Stone Rhino was truly encountered, acting both as a defensive asset for the newly acquired clan worlds, but also being deployed with second-line galaxies and other formations 
designed to defend the interests of their clans on a strategic level. Overwhelmingly, however, these mechs would be seen in service of Clan Smoke Jaguar, at least by those who lived and escaped to report that they'd come across it. These steel bastions were the great guardians of the hard-fought games against the Inner Sphere, their 100-ton, gigantic frames standing against all those who would rise up against the Smoke Jaguars, as well as striking back against the dragon any time it was irrational enough to believe it had any claim on the worlds, or people which now belonged to Clan Smoke Jaguar. But despite having some success and some failures, repulsing combine raids and probing attacks in the 3050s, and despite second line units and mechs, like the Stone Rhino, proving their worth at this time, the Jaguars as a whole were just a wildly spent force, especially in the ways which mattered. Their economy could not keep up with the losses they'd suffered. This would even result in the invention of Protomex, in fact. They were unable to marshal the territorial gains they'd made in order to utilize their new resources, often because of their own cruelty and brutality. They faced constant rebellion, and even this was sapping their strength, something they could ill afford while trying to rebuild themselves. It would ironically be the behavior of Clan Jade Falcon, which would seal their fate. The Falcons acting aggressively in an attempt to conceal their own deficiencies accidentally united the entirety of the houses in 3058 after they staged an attack on the Federated Commonwealth. Seeing the overwhelming forces arrayed against them, the Jade Falcons conceded quietly and returned to their occupied zones. Leo Showers would have turned in his grave if his mangled corpse had one of note at what happened next. One of the primary goals by the invading clans had been to prevent the reunification of a new Star League without the clan's involvement. Unfortunately, because of Clan Jade Falcon's outburst, it pushed the Inner Sphere finally into reforming the Star League as a result, ironically, of the clan menace. Chancellor Liao Sun Tzu became the restored First Lord of the Star League the first man to officially be recognized as such since the death of Richard Cameron on Terra in 2766. Even more tragic for the Jaguars, to display their might, the Star League would opt to make an example to the clans. A show of strength. The original consideration was to make the Jade Falcons the display, but that clan had fallen under hard times, and the same was true for their next option, Wolf. They wanted to break the back of a strong clan, to dissuade the others from thinking that it was wise to fight them. It was believed by the Inner Sphere that the clan that was now strongest in the region that they could reach was in fact Clan Smoke Jaguar. This would make the Jaguars the choice for the assault, on top of their heinous reputation, and there would be two major offensives planned, Operation Bulldog and Operation Serpent. The perception at the time of the attack that the Jaguars were the strongest clan force in the Inner Sphere may have simply been an optimistic vision of reality on behalf of the Star League, given the catastrophic state of Clan Smoke Jaguar prior to their rebuilding process. The force was rife with new recruits and rapidly assembled equipment, despite Con Lincoln Osis' efforts. Osif himself would become Ilkhan during this time, just prior to the launch of the Inner Sphere's counterattack. Ironically, Osis had first already broken the ceasefire put in place at Tukiyat, preparing the clans as a whole to invade the Inner Sphere once more. The planned assault, however, would be delayed for months due to the machinations of Con Vlad Ward of Clan Wolf and Con Martha Pride of Jade Falcon, who deliberately wanted to undermine the new Ilkhan for their own rise to power in hopes of leading the invasion themselves. This gave all the clans time to prepare, though. No one knew what cataclysm now awaited the clans, especially Smoke Jaguar. Bulldog would be launched first, and was the much more straightforward attack. The Inner Sphere's unified assault would not only be ambitious in scale, it would go beyond that with plans to entirely abolish 
any remnants of Clan Smoke Jaguar's presence in the Inner Sphere proper. Bulldog would actually start with Operation Bird Dog, which opened the offensive on May 13th, 3059. The Smoke Jaguar Tumen was nowhere near ready for what was being unleashed. In fact, they themselves were in the early stages of making plans to attack the Inner Sphere, not the other way around. Omnimech forces were smashed in the assault, and second line forces fared little better. The Stone Rhino, as rare as it was, would be seen on the battlefields that raged during the oncoming waves of Inner Sphere attacks, fighting in desperate, hopeless battles to retain the clan's territories but also to retain the dignity of Clan Smoke Jaguar once the unexpected offensive had fallen upon them. Neither would be left intact. After the first two waves of the Inner Sphere's advances, which had torn through the once-held territories of the clan, in July of 3059, the Smoke Jaguar Tumen would marshal most of what was left of its strategic reserves and strength to launch a major counteroffensive against the Inner Sphere. Frontline and second-line formations would be activated in this attack. Any mech that could be put into battle most assuredly was. The huge lumbering forms of the Stone Rhino once more proudly walked alongside its Omnimech counterparts. But even the Jaguar Command knew this counterattack was a tragic venture. Aiming their assaults at vital supply depots that had been set up to feed the advancing Inner Seer forces, the warriors in this attack hoped to sell their lives to buy their brethren, the remaining defenders, the time they needed to try to reorganize. Even with more time, it'd have not have changed the results. With no regard for their own lives, the Smoke Jaguars attacked, most principally on McAllister. This attack cost the Jaguars over 30 mechs, and they did indeed destroy the intended supply depots, but they were unable to even grasp at the scale of what they were doing. It was an irrelevance. Despite destroying the new SLDF supplies, the Juggernaut just rolled forward, colliding against the defenders just as relentlessly as before. The new Star League Defense Force was like an unstoppable tsunami, crashing against the Smoke Jaguar's low-lying islands in the Inner Sphere. Clan warriors in their mechs were simply overwhelmed and outpositioned. One can't help but imagine as the third wave was unleashed, the ancient, Battle-scarred stone rhinos fighting desperately alongside their peers in these one-sided struggles, being devastated by either artillery, aerospace assets, or simply hordes of vehicles and other battle mechs. Operation Bulldog evolved from a military campaign to a slaughter by clan standards. This was more than ironic as well, considering how successful the Jaguars had been in their opening offensive on the Inner Sphere and the Draconis Combine. Wave 4 was little more than a cleanup of the once proud clan forces in the Inner Sphere. Operationally, the Tumen of Clan Smoke Jaguar was eliminated locally, or forced into some form of shameful surrender, either against the broader new SLDF or against the Draconis Combine's mustered soldiery. After the battle was over, the after-action report was damning as far as clan performance was concerned. What was thought of as the mightiest of the remaining clans in the Inner Sphere had been in fact a paper jaguar. In naval forces they would trade evenly with the SLDF approximately, but that was just the battles taking place in the void. On the ground, it was catastrophic by comparison. SLDF forces inflicted twice as many casualties and kills on the Smoke Jaguars than they received in return, even with the disastrous performance by the SLDF on Luzerne, which took the SLDF several attempts to take. The defeat was so complete that only approximately one to two galaxies managed to escape the occupation zone in its entirety. The Jaguar Tumen in this occupation zone started with, on paper, nine full galaxies, though the quality of the troops within and their total complements would be somewhat questionable, especially given the campaign's results. Operation Bulldog was nothing short of a complete disaster and failure for Clan Smoke Jaguar, and it was a disaster that was far from over. Developed during Operation Revival, 
though specifically when is not listed. The Stone Rhino 4 was built as a test platform by Clan Smoke Jaguar, though it would see service in the bloody battles of the Inner Spheres counteroffensive into the Jaguar's held areas. Heavily gunned in a multitude of ways, with several diverse systems, it is an impressive machine to behold. Outside of its one enormous weakness, which hampers it severely as a real combat mech. To start with, it sacrifices armored protection on the body in order to entertain its enormous weapons package. It has 16.5 tons of standard plating instead of 18, reducing its total armor to 264 points. This wouldn't be the end of the world, despite its increased fragility, were it not for its other weakness. This isn't a quirk either. The 4 utilizes 7 tons of standard heat sinks on board to keep the mech cool, for an unknown reason. This means it can only cool 17 per turn, meaning it would literally have been better off spending zero tonnage and just having double heat sinks, like the core model. What makes it even more baffling is that this has a Clan 300XL engine, which is expensive in the most extreme ways. This means that the decision to install standard heat sinks on board can't have been a cost consideration. It's just a hard decision to fathom. Despite its bizarre heat management decisions, it has an array of deadly weapons. The Stone Rhino 4 has almost every weapon type on board. It has four Clan ER medium lasers in total with two in each arm. And these are accompanied by machine guns in each arm as well, with a full ton of ammunition. This gives it energy weapons to hit well and close, as well as anti-infantry capabilities. Next up, it installs twin Ultra AC-10s, with one in each torso, and a total of 40 rounds of ammunition. These hit reliably and churn out fire as needed, provided they don't jam. To back all of this up, it has four LRM-10 launchers, once more in the torso, and four tons of ammunition in total. This gives it long range and direct fire options. The Stone Rhino 4, regardless of the fact it's just a test platform, is fantastically gunned. Were it to shed its tonnage of standard heat sinks to even just none, but shifting over to double heat sinks, it'd be a deadly adversary to stand opposite to in any campaign. Instead, it's a hot box, and one which outside of desperate times should be relegated to a training role, especially given the volume of ammunition on board and it's obviously high heat potential. It's a shame. This is in essence a slow, gigantic fireworks display because of this decision. The joint assault on the Jaguars would always be envisioned in two steps, as mentioned prior, one being the devastating Operation Bulldog, and the other being the finishing blow, Task Force Serpent, or Operation Serpent. On May 1st, 3059, Serpent would launch into the Great Unknown, moving along the path of the Exodus Road, as the original Star League Defense Forces had centuries earlier retreading the steps of those once brave defenders of the Inner Sphere, whose descendants had fallen so far as human beings as to view those who lived normal lives with disdain. The operation's main goal had always been Huntress, the home of Clan Smoke Jaguar, the lair of the wounded beast. Using deception and infiltration to knock out the planet's space defense systems, the gigantic fleet of Inner Sphere warships and jumpships would arrive in the Huntress system, protected by three warships still, including an enormous Soviet-class cruiser. A vicious space battle would open up, but it would be short, and end favorably for the SLDF. Huntress laid open for the Unified Task Force, and its thousand-plus battle mechs, as well as other impressive forces, to land and begin the onslaught on the clan which had begun the madness of the clan invasion. The consequences of Operation Revival had arrived home for Clan Smoke Jaguar. The disparity in forces were like a gulf between the heavens and the earth, and despite bravery, Clan Smoke Jaguar's struggles were irrelevant. But they were telling, and on Huntress, the Stone Rhino would display its full value, 
fulfilling the original goal Stefan Amaris set out for the Matar, in all irony. Mech warrior Jacinda Wirth would perhaps have made history had Smoke Jaguar not been destroyed so thoroughly, and now she sits as just a footnote of it. As a blood-named clan warrior, she fought to keep her clan alive, and fought to maintain her own genetic legacy into the future. As the world was collapsing around her, as the homeworld of Clan Smoke Jaguar was under assault from Freebirths, hell bent on revenge for the actions of Clan Smoke Jaguar itself, she would fight with every fiber of her being to resist what was happening, no matter the odds. Jacinda would find herself in a battle mech which was over a century old, a stone rhino. It was a symbol, perhaps, of Smoke Jaguar at this point, as much as it was a war machine. The example was known for its own unique personality quirks even, but it changed little. On Huntress, in the Shikari jungle, she would engage the Knights of the Inner Sphere in a vain attempt to hold back the invaders of her home. The nearby Cadet Training Academy had already marshaled its own defenders, using a combination of protomex, battle armor, and a few remaining clan mechs that could be assembled. It meant nothing in the wave of attacks from the Inner Sphere's best. Jacinda in her stone rhino would engage a full company of knights on her terms in the infernal environment as the world itself seemed to be coming to an end all around her. It's hard to know what mechs the knights of the inner sphere had at their own disposal, but if we look at similar forces that were operating in the area, they were typically a mixture of all weight brackets and well-trained and battle-seasoned pilots. No battle such as this could be stationary with any hopes of Jacinda winning, and would have required repositioning and maneuver. Her hulking machine would encounter the knights and destroy them, before moving on. The monster Emperor Amaris envisioned would blast through the best inner sphere mechs to hand, all at a Star League era technology level, and of various weights. It's remarkable that she would destroy eight enemy battle mechs before her own stone rhino, simply started to malfunction, its own worn parts screaming in protest as she pushed it further and further beyond its capabilities. Driven by a primeval drive to defend her home and her potential offspring, ironically as the people of the Inner Sphere only a decade earlier had defending their homes, Jacinda resorted to melee combat in her 100-ton monster of a machine, driving the stone rhino into the teeth of the enemy as her systems began to fail. With the power of the dishonorable physical assault and energy attack she'd unleashed, a further two mechs would be downed, before the mech's heat system was totally overwhelmed, and the stone rhino ceased being operational. In fact, she'd driven the mech so hard, her own thermal situation had become untenable. Jacinda succumbed to heat exhaustion within her mech. In the war zone, of the Shikari jungle. She would be pried free from the mech by medics, though it is not stated from which side, and became conscious only for a short time, rambling deliriously that no man would ever pilot her stone rhino. Shortly after, she succumbed to her heat exhaustion and died. Jacinda's sacrifice and the determined last battle of the stone rhino seemingly on Huntress encompassed the total failure of Clan Smoke Jaguar. The Jaguars would resist further, but it was of little point. In the aftermath, the Great Refusal would take place, and it would end with Prince Victor Ian Steiner Davian slaying Ilkhan Lincolnosis, the last and final Khan of Clan Smoke Jaguar. This marks the end of the Clan invasion, and the end of the Clan that caused it. But much like the Mad Dog, the legacy of the Stone Rhino the titan that it was, would not be so easily diminished, simply because its master had perished. Another product of the clan invasion era. The Stone Rhino 5 would be one of the final behemoths designed and developed by Clan Smoke Jaguar, before its inglorious end. Once more a model reducing its armor capacity to 16.5 tons, 
this stone rhino is likely the strangest and probably least effective model to date. It installs a wildly expensive Clantec 400XL engine on board, giving it an impressive maximum speed of 64 kilometers per hour. It then goes on to install two extra tons of double heat sinks in order to keep the machine running cool. Where things get strange for this machine is in its weaponry. Its primary weapons are four LB5X autocannons, with two in each side torso. Each cannon has two tons of ammunition as well, with equal parts solid and cluster as a default. These systems are extremely long-ranged and would be an asset against flying targets, but they may lack the raw firepower needed to bring down a battle mech of significant size. Apparently, this model of Stone Rhino was built to replicate the original Matar, which honestly seems a bit outlandish given its primary armament. This variant seems much more akin to the Republic's Malice, a mech built eight decades later, than it does the Matar in terms of its configuration. Beyond this, it supports 6 ER medium lasers, with three in each arm. In short, it's a much faster version of the Stone Rhino, but one which invests its remaining weaponry's tonnage into LB-5Xs, which are great at dissecting lighter targets like armor or aircraft, rather than full-on battle mechs. While the 4 may have had heat issues, and was built around the same time, it's just strange to see the 5 be so wildly undergunned for its intended role. The best virtue it has is when not using the advanced rules, it can pick up and move much faster when needed. Its biggest drawback? It's hardly a match for almost any of its peers, including the Inner Sphere's assault mechs on the battlefield. The death of a clan as storied as Smoke Jaguar, and one which had been such a force in clan politics and society, sent shockwaves through the now defeated clans in the wake of the Great Refusal. One of the most successful predators grabbing the old holdings and resources of the Jaguars, though, would be a clan often less directly involved with matters, though ones that prized the Star League era and preserving all that they could of it. That was, of course, Clan Goliath Scorpion. Holding these captured territories proved difficult for the now fatigued clan, which had expended vital assets in capturing them. The Scorpions needed replacement battle mechs to fill out the line. A choice was made to put their new territories to good use and begin manufacturing new battle mechs to hold them, particularly second line ones. Marshalling what they could to make it so, it appeared that the Stone Rhino would have a new lease on life through Clan Goliath Scorpion, serving in its tomb. Now, one might expect, since they'd captured some facilities that built or could build parts for the Stone Rhino, and they had examples of the mechs themselves, that using the Smoke Jaguar's factories, which constructed these things functionally, would make it easy to produce these battle mechs. You only think that, however, because you aren't a member of Clan Goliath Scorpion, and or you aren't likely doing hard drugs consistently. Because what if I told you that's not what they did at all? Instead of using the more or less near ready to go infrastructure and supply chains to build the Stone Rhino, which clearly Clan Goliath Scorpion wanted to do, their Khan Suvorov opted to not manufacture the mech directly or just reconfigure its weapon systems. Instead, Suvorov would order the science and technician casts to examine old documents for the Behemoth, better known now as the Matar, to reverse engineer it into a new battle mech that was almost indistinguishable from the Stone Rhino, but in doing so, mildly changing its appearance, all while functionally changing none of the issues with the core chassis. For a clan low on resources, and in general wanting to avoid waste, this was an interesting decision on the part of Clan Goliath Scorpion. A further baffling choice would come next, with the apparent directive to not utilize existing factories from the parts and portions of the Smoke Jaguar conquests to assemble these new stone rhinos. Instead, they'd pick one of their own original worlds. The mech would be named the Stone Rhino 2, denoting it as a variant, and it was put into production on Tokasha, which would require the transfer or construction of whole new production lines, 
which in Battletech is a Herculean venture, even for the clans. This series of questionable undertakings would not pay off for Clan Goliath Scorpion in the long run, as the Wars of Reaving would unfold approximately a decade after production got underway, and it did little to nothing to change the outcome for them. Clan Steel Viper had been the ones to open that hornet's nest, led by Ilkhan Brett Andrews, claiming that the clans with inner sphere influence had become tainted and had departed from the ways of the Founder. He would propose not only the expulsion of these clans from the homeworlds, but the reaving of bloodlines tainted by the inner sphere. In a war of violence, paranoia, and borderline insanity, the homeworld clans would slowly purge themselves of the taint which Brett Andrews had spoken of, ironically including himself, as he was declared tainted by the council, and his clan was subjected to destruction as well, with the remnants being absorbed into Clan Star Adder. The only problem was, Clan Goliath Scorpion had absorbed part of the Eridani Light Horse, as they indulged themselves in believing that these people were relics of the Star League. This act would result in them being declared tainted themselves. A trial of absorption would be declared, immediately, and as the other remaining homeworld clans gathered their strength to force the issue, the Goliath Scorpions moved their assets out of clan space, before leaping into the Great Unknown, taking their Stone Rhino II with them into the Void. To conquer the deep periphery states of Nueva Castile and the Umayyad Caliphate, Eventually, they would crush the Hanseatic League as well, after which they would declare they had formed the Scorpion Empire. The facilities on Tokasho would be taken from the Scorpions by one other clan, however, even prior to the Reaving. One which, too, would make their way into the Inner Sphere. Clan Hell's Horses One of the most bizarre casualties of the Project Phoenix redesigns, the Stone Rhino 2's backstory became a confusing mess as a result of the idea that Clan Goliath Scorpion would just remake the Stone Rhino from scratch, despite having the functional ability to just use the template of the original. All the same, this 100-ton assault mech possesses, as far as I can discern, the same quirks and functionality of the original albeit with a questionable series of strange choices to increase its firepower, but at a steep price in-universe and without. To start with, it maintains a standard internal structure, cockpit and gyro. Next up, it invests more substantially in heat sinks, namely six tons of them. This gives the Stone Rhino 2 the ability to disperse 32 heat per turn. In the realm of movement, the Stone Rhino 2 moves the same plodding 54 kilometers per hour as the Stone Rhino 1, but it achieves this speed through installing a 9.5-ton General Systems 300XL fusion power plant. This means that its side torsos expose the engine on board, but more critically, it makes it more vulnerable to damage or destruction. Though Clan XL technologies tend to be less immediately dooming in this respect than the primitive Star League or Inner Sphere XL engines that are opposite to it. The other issue behind this is that the Stone Rhino, the original, is more or less very inexpensive due to its lack of overinvesting in extremely costly technologies, helping it be more economically viable for a smaller economy. The Goliath Scorpions clearly didn't remember this when they installed the hugely expensive engine into the machine. It can also still jump 90 meters, which is nice. In terms of protection, the Behemoth 2 is guarded like an atlas, with a full 19 tons of standard plating which is more than enough to keep this thing in any fight by sheer volume alone. It has 304 points of armor to be distributed across the body, meaning it needs to be hit by over 30 PPC rounds in order to entirely strip it of its outer layer of protection. Where things do become more questionable is its weapons loadout, as despite using many of the same approximate hard points as the original, it pivots wildly away from the accurate, reliable fire that the original did. To start with, it maintains two Gauss rifles, similar to the original but in a wildly different upper chassis compartment. These are good at any range, and they provide a greater base of firepower. The problem isn't the Gauss rifles. The problem is more centered on its other weapon systems. These other weapons are a pair of heavy large lasers, four medium heavy lasers, and two small heavy lasers. All of these weapons are split between its two arms. 
Now these weapons do hit hard, but the issue is they aren't particularly accurate. While yes, the Stone Rhino 2 has four head clipping weapons, it cannot really utilize any of its other systems at all. If firing these heavy duty weapons, which almost always will be the preference if you're fighting mech targets, just for the chance of an instant knockout, it brings into question why it has the other weapons. So in other words, it has a bunch of close range weapons that are just hard to justify using due to its inadequate cooling system to manage this huge array of heavy lasers. Worse still, unlike pulse lasers, heavy lasers are in fact less accurate, meaning the odds of hitting are in fact just penalized in game. This battle mech and its heavy lasers do pack a heavy punch, but it's one that's less reliable and one which may cause the mech to overheat very, very quickly if not managed correctly. The Stone Rhino 2 is a very expensive battle mech, built to defend the holdings of Clan Goliath Scorpion, and one which might have a higher damage ceiling than its originator, though at the cost of being very much more vulnerable in many ways. Where did the Stone Rhino go after the vicious wars of Reaving? Was it trapped in the confines of Clan Space? Or in the deep periphery inside of the Scorpion Empire? Was that the last the mech warriors and soldiers of the Inner Sphere would see of it? Was it just a nightmare, but one which the people of the Inner Sphere could wake up from once the Clan occupation forces and eventual hybrid states simply ran out of their limited numbers of them? Sadly for those in the Inner Sphere, that's not exactly what took place. Because of the arrival and the eventual establishment of Clan Hell's Horses. And perhaps the only truly relevant and successful military campaign in its history, Clan Hell's Horses would prepare their own invasion of the Inner Sphere, not fighting the Inner Sphere powers to diminish their honor as per the Great Refusal, but to assault the Clan Occupation Zone. Their goal was simple acquire their own foothold in the Inner Sphere, just at the expense of their clan comrades. The attack would be launched in 3070 and met with incredible success, crashing into the Wolf Occupation Zone like a tidal wave, though also bulging into Clan Jade Falcon holdings as well. Dozens of worlds would fall before them, including their eventual capital world and their main manufacturing world, Sheshtreg. A world which would ultimately be forever connected to the Stone Rhino. The Wars of Reaving would begin to rage on the homeworlds all while this took place. And in the Inner Sphere, the Word of Blake would begin their assault on the now former members of the Second Star League. The Hell's Horses would persist through both of these cataclysms. Though only in the Inner Sphere would their true legacy continue on. Their holdings on the homeworld would see the Hell's Horses mutate into a new clan after being battered at the insistence of the victorious homeworld clans, becoming Clan Stone Lion. But what of those who returned to the broader home of humanity? The Hell's Horses would become a bizarre force, one which is responsible for mutating clan warfare with the brutal Mongol doctrine but seldomly performing it well in any military bout or campaign that they were a part of. All the same, with their holdings solidified, they would set down roots and begin the process of upgrading local industries or building whole new production platforms and infrastructure in their new core territories. Prior to 3070, it should be noted that Clan Hell's horses captured portions of Tokasha, including those building the new Stone Rhino. This information would be passed on to the Hell's horses prior to their invasion, if only just. And when setting up their new manufacturing base, a decision was made by the horses that they would embrace and build the mighty Stone Rhino. It's important to note the horses themselves actually are not particularly resource rich, nor are they particularly technologically advanced by clan standards, making the Stone Rhino a superb fit for them. Sheshtreg would become the forge to build this steel behemoth as new production lines were put into place. Fascinatingly enough, they would take their knowledge from Tokasha not to build the Stone Rhino chassis which the Goliath Scorpions had, but instead 
Hell's Horses would build the legacy of Clan Smoke Jaguar's monster, the original frame and even design of the Stone Rhino. These titanic battle mechs would be walking off the assembly line, forged anew, to herald the arrival of a new army, a new horde, and one just as barbaric in many ways as the Smoke Jaguars who first wielded this gargantuan with such brutality. Clan Hell's horses would have these ready as a part of their tumen for the great rampage they now embarked upon in the Inner Sphere in their own ambitious plot during the Ill Clan era. The Stone Rhino in its many forms now thunders along in assault formations, both in the attack, yet also vitally in the defense. While the horses grew in strength, building their tumen, organizing their doctrines, and preparing themselves for glory, Clan Jade Falcon under Malvina Hazen, and the reunified Clan Wolf under Alaric Ward would commence their own all-or-nothing bids for Terra, the once capital of the Republic of the Sphere, in order to claim the ill clanship for their clans. Malvina would fall short, and along with her, almost the entirety of Clan Jade Falcon's Tumen would be shattered. Its frontline residuals would become puppets of the man who crowned himself Ilkhan of the Ill Clan and the first lord of a new clan-directed Star League, Alaric Ward. The Hell's Horses would be the only clan who would not recognize this claim. Indeed, they would go a step beyond not recognizing this claim. Instead, they would reject it, and whatever claims Clan Wolf had. For their neighbors, however, all hell was about to be let loose. For the Horde, the Tumen of Clan Hell's Horses, were forged in the hardest of steel. With Clan Jade Falcon gone, the empire that once contained them was nothing but ground that would be trampled under hoof by the mighty steeds of this mighty clan. Operation Stampede would be launched by Khan Gottfried Amaralt in 3151, but it was meant to be a multi-stage operation. Looking to prevent losses to the bulk of the Hell's Horses Tumen, Smaller and often greener forces were initially used as the tip of the arrow being plunged into the defunct Jade Falcons, and other new states which were evolving out of the Jade Falcons' collapse in the wake of Malvina's death and the destruction of the majority of their Tumen. This was, in short, the wrong approach. In many of these assaults on the former Falcon worlds, however, one can only imagine the horror on the faces of their once allies, the Jade Falcons, as the rhino's heavy feet crushed the earth before them, their pulse lasers firing and their gauss rifles cracking the sound barrier multiple times with every slug fired. In the flames of burnt-out defenses and battle mechs, they would see a specter of a behemoth become real once more. But whilst Clan Hell's horses did take many worlds, their units ended up becoming bogged down by a multitude of problems. First, they were outfought by the last lingering elements of the Tumen of Clan Jade Falcon in the decisive assault on Sudaden initiated by the horses, the Falcons then being under the command of their new Khan, G. Chistu. In the battle, the horses would lose an entire cluster early on, causing the Khan and Saw Khan of the horses to have a significant argument as to the right way to approach the remainder of the operation. Splitting the command early on would play a major role in making the planned assault on the world more troublesome for the aggressors, reducing the effect of their superior numbers. Through underestimating the weakened Falcons, even refusing to engage them in honorable clan warfare on the basis that they considered them to be the dregs of a dead clan, the conflict would turn into a series of viciously contested firefights as both sides tried to force the other into their own ideal engagement environments. Chistu also displayed that he was a superb tactician and strategist, using his enemy's strengths against them, all while using deception and cat-and-mouse engagements to tire, frustrate, and deplete his opposition. The battle would end with Chistu luring the horses into a death trap in an abandoned city, where he released his reserves upon them. Before the final confrontation could be done, Amaralt realized he would lose the battle he now found himself in. He would issue a surrender to Chistu before quitting the field and the planet. This would mark the greatest disaster and reversal in the horse's recent history. 
Sudaden was, however, not the only battle in the overambitious campaign to go wrong. Operation Stampede met stiff resistance on multiple fronts against Lyran nationalists, emerging from some of these regions, as well as separatist nations like the Tamar Pact, as all sides scrambled for the carcass of the now dead Falcon Empire. The Lyran Commonwealth too was now on the march, looking to restore its rule over wayward worlds and former territories. This major state, certainly with its own problems and desperate for resources it badly needed, is still no pushover and is a major obstacle to the horse's authority in the region. It is far stronger than any of the other regional players that have emerged in the chaos, and it is one the horses will not be able to ignore now. Because they failed to decisively show their strength and power, Clan Hell's horses is now contested in the region they believed they would come to dominate almost immediately. This means that the original quick operation, one which was just a stepping stone on the path to a glorious confrontation with Alaric Ward on Terra, has become a desperate struggle for the long-term survival of the last clan to migrate back to the Inner Sphere. The Hinterlands is a region now with multiple belligerents, all willing to fight viciously for every inch of territory. Khan Amaralt's mistake in not committing the entire Tumen so quickly is a major contributor to the discord that now flows through the area called the Hinterlands, a region offering a great resemblance towards the Chaos March of the 31st century. Regardless of gaining important worlds and leverage in other regions, this failure would not be allowed to go unaddressed, especially given Clan Hell's horse's lack of victories in the years preceding the event. Amaralt would be killed by his second-in-command, then saw Khan Falk Lacerna. The new Khan's eyes are somehow both set upon the hinterlands, knowing full well what is at stake for his clan. Before his horde, his stampede, can trample their way to Terra, they will need to crush their enemies in this now contested region, restoring their strength, proving their honor and skill, declaring a great victory and then forcing all in their path to recognize their power. Clan Hell's horses and their Khan will be acknowledged. The Stone Rhinos at the head of the stampede, charging forward, horns set forth, demand it. The Stone Rhino is to me the personification of the clans, barring its lack of being an Omnimech. This terror from an age before their existence was created by the Ameris Empire and was conceived to enforce the brutal and unjust rule of a band of thugs who had taken over the Terran hegemony. Like their regime, it failed, but not for effort. When Clan Smoke Jaguar resurrected the despondent, malicious, dread-driving project that was the Matar, it, in my view, showed the completion of the divergence from the path which Alexander Kerensky had set the Star League Defense Forces upon when he took them into exile. There was hope in what he believed for mankind, a forlorn hope that humanity would pull itself out of the spiral it had taken itself into, just prior to their leaving. Had the Alexander Kerensky who made his proclamation to the Inner Sphere survived to see what most of the brave men and women he'd commanded turned into? Had he seen the Pentagon Wars at their most violent? Or had he seen the putrid society which his son had created? Alexander would have surely wept. When he left, everyone with him felt they were still embodying the stated goals, though not necessarily the reality of what the Star League was. It was a noble venture to them, something to be upheld, and something to be undertaken for the good of all mankind. The society that built the Stone Rhino, in particular the Smoke Jaguars, but their cohorts and other clans were only a few degrees away from their world view, were prejudiced, disdainful for the majority of mankind, elitist, and venerated ritualized violence, so long as it was on their terms. The caste society Nicholas created, and was sustained after his death, is one which dropped life expectancies across all populations by decades. 
even though it had the power to extend lives. It is a society that cared nothing for the meaning in normal people's lives, save for their cadre of warriors, who would be prompted to enact alien behaviors and indulge in their worst instincts. In fact, the true-born people even have worse cultural norms on top of that, which I won't discuss in this video. Nevertheless, all of this is done in the name of some genetic immortality which is promised to them. The stone rhino was built in the image of the Matar, which was a symbol of tyranny and oppression. It is not hard to see that the stone rhino, its first successor, and born of the descendants of those who put a stop to Stefan Ameris, is a machine which still embodies brutal and vicious regimes. It would embody that even more once it became a second line mech, where it would be used against populations which had become unruly, or those who shed the prison that was clan society to become dark cast. When it was used in the invasion of the Inner Sphere and in the Battle of Tukiat, this abomination was used no less thuggishly than the mechs deployed by the Rimworld's army in their capture and occupation of the Terran hegemony. It was a weapon of fear, turned against an enemy who they sought to enslave, perhaps with even a worse end goal in many respects than Ameris's grand designs. Then, of all things, it fulfilled the original purpose of its progenitor in the Battle of Huntress. During the latter eras of Battletech, it has been used for the same less than noble purposes at the forefront of destroying people's homes in the deep periphery, or acting as a battering ram for the stampede which now tries to overwhelm the hinterlands. The Stone Rhino is a story of the clans after their founding, as much as it is tied into the story of before their birth. It has been with them since the mid-29th century, and it reflects who they became after enacting the societal philosophies and ideals of Nicholas Kerensky. It is fitting that it was the depraved people of Clan Smoke Jaguar, those who demanded the invasion of the Inner Sphere more than any others, are the ones who created this tyrannical colossus. But their contemporaries and the great founder are little to no different, truthfully. The behemoth unleashed upon the enemies of the clans is an affront to what the Star League Defense Forces were. It is a steel Kronos, forged in arrogance, and a disdain for people who are deemed lesser, which is almost the sum total of humanity. The Stone Rhino displays what the clans really are, and how Alexander Kerensky lost in the end. It was his people, the SLDF, the exiles that followed him, who became the monsters they sought to save the people of the Inner Sphere from. To all citizens of the Inner Sphere, do I, Alexander Kerensky, send greetings. Know that I have taken the remnants of the Star League Defense Force, which had remained true to its purpose beyond the boundaries of the Inner Sphere, beyond the periphery. I have done this, neither out of disappointment with those whom we leave behind, nor out of spite or disdain, as some would say. No. We have left the Inner Sphere because we love it too much to see it destroyed. In the wake of the Usurper's coup, and the long, bitter fighting that came with it, I fear that my forces would do incalculable, possibly irreparable, harm to our society. We are sworn to ward the Star League and its subjects, not destroy it. Thus, we have left the only home we have ever known to place the destructive capability of this armada beyond the reach of those who would use it. Not for defense, but for conquest. Perhaps with the might of our mechs and ships out of reach, the leaders who now grapple with one another will relinquish their dreams of subjugating their neighbors 
and learn to live in peace with them. Perhaps one day, should mankind step back from the brink of the abyss, we, our children, or our children's children, will return to once more serve and protect and guide the Star League in mankind's quest for the stars. Farewell. Well, where to start after all of that? First, I want to thank all of you for joining me here today. This video has taken longer for me to complete than any prior project that I've ever worked on for the channel, and I am hoping that that shows in the quality of the overall video. And with that, I'm hoping that if you enjoyed this content, that you will hit like for this video, because this definitely, I think, is the best video on the channel. As an aside, if you enjoyed this enough to be around this long, and you're new here, you should definitely subscribe too. I produce a lot of content on this channel, more often as shorter form mech overviews, but sometimes I do these long format deep dives of battle mechs, and how the history of the setting is tied to them. Stick around if you want to hear some of my final notes on the video itself. Before I do though, please, if anyone at CGL watches this, Please, for the love of God, stop giving this high BV mech a bunch of unneeded bad quirks. If this thing has the oversized quirk, why does the Marauder 2 have the narrow quirk? Poor performance as well? You're just killing this thing, it's so sad. I just don't see the justification for any of it, other than it just deliberately being made bad, which isn't really reflected in its in-universe reputation as a terrifying monster. It's also the face of Technical Readout 3055 and one of the most recognizable battle mechs from the 90s. But I digress. I just figured someone should go to bat for this thing. Well, now that that's out of the way, what a wild ride that just was, wasn't it? There is a ton to talk about regarding making this video, but I don't want to linger for too long. First, I obviously love the Stone Rhino and the story around it, as you can probably tell. Second, I felt the Stone Rhino really represents the clans, which I mentioned in the video, and how they became just as twisted, or worse, than the One Star League stopped in the form of Stefan Amaris and his empire. I just wanted to provide as much context as I could when making this video too, exploring not only the mech's origins, but the origins of the people who made it, both in the Amaris Empire and in the clans. I also wanted to talk about the broader events it participated in, and I felt I needed to talk about some events to frame it as well. It was a really hard thing to piece together, and also, ironically, trying to shorten things down in a way that made it fit in the video was really, really hard too. It makes me nervous whenever I do something like this. So, a couple of special thanks are required for this video too. First, the stream audience. For anyone who has helped me capture MechWarrior 5 footage directly on stream, I owe you a huge thank you. Another big thank you also goes in particular to one of the YouTube community members named Enova, who sent me a couple of individual footage shots that he put together as well. Another giant thank you goes to Art of Battletech, who made the skin for the Stone Rhino and modded it into MechWarrior 5, and that was used in this particular video. The original 3D model was made by Brian Bonsai, so a huge shout out to him as well. As a quick note though, the Smoke Jaguar versions of the camouflage in the pack were added because I was making this video, and I really, really have to say I appreciate what Art of Battletech did for this video. Next up, I can't help but thank all of the channel members, both the 200 recurring channel members as well as the gifted members for this channel. This video took weeks to make and was the result of an immense amount of work, and this just wouldn't have been possible without your assistance. I really mean it when I say this, this content is really only made possible by viewers like you. 
so thank you for supporting this channel and what I do with it. Your support is not taken lightly. For anyone who would like to support the content I do in the same way, like this video, you'll want to hit the join button to become a member. It really makes this stuff possible. Finally, what prompted me to make this video? MechWarrior Online recently announced the arrival of the incredible Stone Rhino itself, and I've been getting back into the game a little bit lately. Not only have I always loved the Stone Rhino since its appearance on the cover of my very first own technical readout, 3055, but it's got an incredible artistic design in the game. The imagery was brought to life by the fantastic and talented Alex Iglesias, so a huge shout out to him and MechWarrior Online. All of the resources I use to make this video are going to be listed in the top pinned comment for this video. I'll include links to the Stone Rhino's pre-order as well for MWO, because it looks like it's going to be awesome. As a quick disclaimer, no, Piranha Games in no way paid me to do this. Ironically, if anything, I paid them as I pre-ordered the stupid mech. <laughs> And with all of this now out of the way, I will catch everyone in the comments section below. I look forward to seeing your opinions on all of this.